management and uh, anesthesiologists. So first of all, I would like to invite President RSCP Ludhiana Branch, Dr. Sunil Katyal, sir, to, to welcome you all. Sir is a well-recognized figure in the field of anesthesia, and I don't think that he needs any introduction. Sir, please. Um, good evening, everybody. I will start by conveying my regards to my teacher, Professor Tej K. Kaul. Good evening, sir. I need your blessings. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all the participants in the webinar organized by Research Society of Anesthesiology Clinical Pharmacology. The theme of this meeting is trauma and the anesthesiologist, a very useful and practical topic and covers all the uh, covers a wide range of patients and their problems. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Audible, yes, sir. Sir. Are audible. Yes, sir. I feel happy. We to are the mother. Tazbar. I feel happy to announce that this webinar is hosted by Ludhiana branch of Research Society of Anesthesiology Clinical Pharmacology. This is third mm -hmm. academic activity of Ludhiana branch in the research part. Friends, dreams do not become true through magic. It requires a lot of hard work, determination, sweat, uh, and accurate planning to make it a reality. So I congratulate all the coordinators of this event uh, for their successful, untiring efforts. Now I extend my hearty welcome to our national leaders, Dr. Indrani H. Hemant Kumar, President of the Society, Dr. Anju Garewal, Vice President, and Dr. Naveen Malhotra, President-elect, then Dr. Vishal Singla, Secretary, Dr. Pradeep Bhatia, Speak, uh, Editor, and Dr. Sunil Sethi, Tehira. And Thank them for their continuous guidance support to organize and materialize this event. Without your support, this event could not have been possible. Now, a special welcome to our guest speakers, Professor Kajal Jain, Dr. Jitinder Makkar from PGI Chandigarh, then Dr. Sheila Nain Maitra from Mumbai. And now I feel proud to announce the name of the fourth speaker as he is my student, Dr. Harsimran Singh. He is settled in UK. I assure all of you, we all will feel enlightened with the knowledge after listening to these eminent speakers. Now a big welcome to our chairpersons, Dr. Suresh Kumar Singhal. Dr. Suresh Singhal, I use this platform to congratulate you as you are being elevated as professor and head department of anesthesia PGIMS yesterday only. So my congratulations to you once again. Thank you, Dr. Then Dr. Vivek Gupta, Dr. Vivek Gupta from Ludhiana, Dr. P. N. Kakkar from Delhi, and Dr. Mridul Pandita Rao from Bathinda. They all accepted our request in spite of their busy schedule and spare their time to grace the occasion. Now I welcome our delegates and the students uh, for participating in this event. They will be bubbling with knowledge after attending all the lectures. And to conclude, I wish every success in uh, every success in all the deliberations. And I end with a quote. If your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more, and become more, you are leader. Thank you very much. Long live RSAC. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I request another prominent figure in the field of uh, anesthesia, whose contribution towards anesthesia as well as RSACP is immense. I request President RSACP National, Dr. Indrani Ma'am, to say a few words. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Tanvir. Uh, respected 
डॉक्टर तेज कौन प्रोफेसर अवतार सिंह डॉक्टर नवीन मल्होत्रा प्रोफेसर खटियाल डॉक्टर अंजू विशाल एंड ऑल माई डियर फ्रेंड्स मेजर ट्रोमा हैज बीन वन ऑफ द लीडिंग प्रॉब्लम नॉट जस्ट इन आवर कंट्री बट द एंटायर वर्ल्ड एंड इट नीड्स इमीडिएट रिकग्निशन एंड ट्रीटमेंट लाइफ एंड लिम थ्रेटनिंग इंजरीज कैन पोज सम ऑफ द मोस्ट डिफिकल्ट डिसीशन टू द क्लिनिशियन एंड थ्रू दिस सी एम ई आर एस ए सी पी लुधियाना ब्रांच विल स्प्रेड अवेयरनेस ऑन वेरियस एस्पेक्ट ऑफ ट्रोमा सो आर एस ए सी पी इज द इज गिविंग अ बिग प्लेटफॉर्म फॉर स्प्रेडिंग दिस अवेयरनेस वी हैव अ गैलेक्सी ऑफ स्टार स्पीकर्स हु वुड हाईलाइट दीज गाइडलाइंस I am sure all of us will be stuck to our seat, and we will be enjoying this literary feast. Thank you very much, and over to you, Tanvir. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request Dr. Anju Garewal, ma'am, Vice President, RSACP National, and the webinar coordinator, who has been working real hard for the success of this webinar, ma'am. Please. Thank you, Tanvir. Um, a very good evening to all. Uh, respected Dr. Tejpal, our patron, Dr. S. P. Sharma, uh, Dr. Indrani, ma'am, Dr. Navin Malotra, Dr. Vishal, Dr. Vishal Singla, and all the dignitaries, our esteemed speakers, chairpersons, and dear delegates. It is indeed a pleasure to have you all this evening, uh, talking on a very pertinent topic, as highlighted by Dr. Indrani, ma'am. i think next to covid uh, this is one area which has not dwindled during this entire era of post covid and trauma still stays there uh, the challenges and here we are all to uh, listen to the galaxy of speakers across the country and i'm extremely thankful to professor kajan uh, dr harsimran singh dr sheela Dr. Jitendra Rekar for you know accepting our invitation at such a short notice. Equally thankful to all our chairpersons, Dr. S. K. Singhal, Dr. Babita Gupta, Dr. Rakhi Goel, Dr. Tina Bansal, Dr. Vivek Gupta, Dr. Atri, Dr. Mridul Pandit Rao, Meenu Mridul Pandit Rao, and Dr. Tripad Kaur. So uh, with all your inputs, all your wisdom. collective wisdom we shall be definitely be more wiser at the end of this evening and uh, thank you all for joining us for joining us and we look forward to an interactive evening tonight today over to you tanveer thank you ma'am now i invite dr vishal singla sir secretary rscp national who has been guiding us all along and has been a constant help sir please thanks for the kind words and uh, greetings from research society of anesthesiology and clinical pharmacology good evening respected patron dr tej k kaul sir dr sp sharma sir president dr indrani ma'am president elect dr navin mahotra sir and organizing chair person dr anju garewal ma'am and all participants uh, i welcome all the esteemed speakers and chair persons for the very well crafted webinar here i would also like to welcome and congratulate dr sk singhal sir who was my teacher in post graduation for taking over as the head of the department of pgims rohtak sir heartiest congratulations sir uh, on last doctors day 1st july 2020 we started with our every fortnightly webinar series and then we had our historic, historic first international conference and last webinar we had was regarding the current and the burning issues of medical legal aspect and cyber crime so today academically this is our first webinar which is related to the core super speciality subject of trauma and is also a subject which is largely man made and has high mortality to the mankind today's topics are excellent and i would like to congratulate dr anju garewal ma'am and the team for shaping this webinar so nicely with no new hopes and resolutions for the growth of our society i believe rccp is keeping abreast with the latest we plan plan to take up our next topics especially keeping the needs of our post graduate students and that would be the case presentations 
uh, all the best to the organizing team and uh, over to you dr tanveer thank you thank you sir i would request dr anju garewal to come start with the introduction of the chairpersons thank you tanveer uh, a very good evening to all again and uh, it is indeed an immense pleasure to introduce two doyans in the field of trauma management as chairpersons for the first session um we would invite professor dr sk singh who is a senior professor and also congratulate him on becoming the professor and head of uh, the prestigious pgims rota um his area of interest as i said our trauma care is indeed been um, you know manning and heading the trauma care at pgims rota for a long time in addition what i have really loved is his achievements uh, in which he writes humanity and social service indeed a huge um thank uh, sir for us uh, welcome you sir to chair, co chair with dr babita gupta babita gupta is um, is an is a professor at the J- jpnatc all india institute of medical sciences in uh, new delhi since 2005 an appropriate person to chair uh, the session on trauma management and she is a course director of atls with 75 international and national publications authoring one of the most um, you know well sought books on essentials of trauma anesthesia and intensive care i welcome dr babita gupta to co chair with dr s uh, dr singhal and take the uh, <coughs> proceedings you, uh, i must place on record appreciations and congratulations for uh, senior professor and head dr s k singhal sir uh, he has taken over charge today on 1st april and uh, you can understand on day one there are lots of parties and meetings but he is sitting here with us uh, for the evening academic program artist congratulations sir and welcome and thank you for being here today sir thank you thank you sir thank you so much and congratulations over to you sir thank May you may request the shall chair I, sh- yeah shall i introduce uh, dr kazim yes ma'am sure yeah thank you so much ma'am thank you so much for the kind introduction and indeed it's such a pleasure to be uh, you know part of this uh, session this webinar on this important topic uh, that is trauma trauma which is a topic so close to my heart uh, so without uh, wasting much time i'll introduce dr kajal jain dr kajal jain is working as professor in department of anesthesia and intensive care at pgi chandigarh she is also course director of uh, dm trauma anesthesia and acute care degree course at pgi she is secretary association of obstetric anesthesia and she has more than 100 publications in various peer reviewed journals national as well as international she has also authored many chapters in various books her keen interests are obstetric and trauma anesthesia so i don't think we can have a better person to Uh, talk on this important topic that is point of care ultrasound in trauma triage so ultrasound uh, have, we have come a long way in a very short time like for a multiple knob the big machine to almost a palm top and uh, it's uh, it's called a stethoscope but i think it's a bit it's better than stethoscope it does diagnosis as well as well as help in interventions so to you dr kajal webinar Your mic is off, Doctor Kajal. Yeah, your yeah, mic is yeah, off. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, am I heard now? And is my screen being shared? Yes, your double and your screen is being shared. Uh, and uh, as uh, I must thank everybody who have come before me and have uh, you know uh, talked about the various uh, dignitaries and the senior leaders of RSACP. already before we started seminar i have congratulated dr navin for keeping up with the you know this um, uh, big job of uh, delivering academics at the home uh, at the home front of all of us so uh, i really appreciate that and so i bring greetings to you all from uh, pj chandigarh this is our uh, trauma center you can see on the right side of my screen so we are having a lot of uh, um, uh, throughout this covid period we did not have even a single day when we 
uh, did not encounter any problem here because we have all untested patients coming. And um, so as we are all COVID warriors, you must know that trauma is very, very important. So uh, we talk about the topic today, that is uh, point of care ultrasound in trauma, a, necess a necessary skill set in trauma triage. Well, I also feel that it's very important, but I will not be able to talk about all the things in half an hour. So I thought I will focus on the most important, that is the fast examination. So if I cannot cover all, please pardon me because uh, we this is the one most single important thing we, which all residents must learn. So uh, I take you to a case. Um, I think somebody's mic is on. Can somebody please uh, switch, mute the person? So there's a, uh, just imagine if there's a 36 years old male patient who presents to trauma bay and this always happens at the wrong hours, say sometime at 3 a.m. Or, or, or even even worse than that. And then you see that the patient has got a penetrating, uh, you know, wound and then he's uh, lying in a pool of blood. And at that point of time, you have to know uh, as a primary survey, uh, what's going wrong. And in, if, if in that primary survey, you find that patient has got feeble pulses, tachycardia and low blood pressure, uh, you are left to, uh, you know, um, query, well, what should I do? Because most of these patients would be unstable and not stable. And in such unstable patients, uh, one feels very anxious at this point of time in the night. So wheeling these patients to big machines may not be possible because uh, CT scanners are a little distance away. And what comes to us handy is then this ultrasound machine. As Dr. Babita has already said that, uh, you know, this is going to turn out to be the stethoscope of the 21st century. And I also agree with her because this is a necessary skill set which all anesthesiologists must possess. How to learn to do emergency ultrasound in trauma triage. So, well, if you talk about uh, point of care ultrasound, then focused assessment by sonography in trauma takes the lead. It was first introduced by this um, anesthesiologist, uh, Rosaik, 1996. And it was... It was initially called as focused abdominal sonography in trauma, but later on it was replaced as focused assessment by sonography in trauma because it was not only meant for, uh, you know, abdomen. We'll just have look at that in, in a bit. So when we talked about FAST, that is focused assessment uh, by sonography in trauma, we were looking at right upper quadrant and then we were looking at a left upper quadrant and we were looking at a pelvic view. But... There were two more views added to it. That those were the lung views and the cardiac views, and that all these together constituted the new terminology, which was called the extended fast or the E fast. So E fast was first introduced by Dr. Kirk, Kirk Patrick because through series of studies and through series of you know evidence based medicine in 2004, this group realized that. Uh, it is important to include lungs and cardiac views also. For pericardial effusion, it was given to us by Plummer et al. And for pneumothorax, it was given by Lichtenstein et al. Uh, these views were first described by these people. So we have to give the credit of EFAS <laughs> totality to these, uh, anesthesia, uh, these, these uh, groups. So when would EFAST be indicated? EFAST would be indicated in hemodynamically unstable trauma patients like the one which I just showed you. It could also be done for patients presenting to us with abdominal and thoracic blunt or penetrating trauma. Or if there's a previously stable trauma patient but has now showing clinical worsening. But if there is a clear, inidentifiable and other immediate need of bailing in the patient for OR, then you can... Uh, you know, skip it off. So what actually do you mean by fast? Sometimes you do forget in haste because, you know, trauma is all about acute emergencies. There's a high cognitive load. And it, as residents, we may forget what exactly we have to do. But I would say that if you are in haste, just look for fluid. You look fluid, whether my patient has fluid in the thorax, whether my patient has fluid in the pericardium, does my patient have, uh, um, you know, pneumothorax? 
and does my patient have free fluid in the abdomen so these are the things which should come to your mind when you talk about fast even if you don't remember the full fast you know so why e fast is good because e fast you know you can do it bedside you don't have to wheel out your patient anywhere it can be done rapidly and repeatedly you if you find there is no finding but your patient is turning unstable you can repeat it and of course it is non invasive so okay. this gives us an edge over other investigations but on the same hand it is not as accurate as ct but faster it is better than doing a diagnostic peritoneal lavage which is not used anymore and it is also superior to physical exam therefore e fast is a necessary skill set for all of us so before you scan you can remember this uh, acronym scanning which means that you must have uh, your supplies your comfortable position ambience your name and procedure you should know which transducer to use and you have to follow the strict precautions for the infection control particularly in this pandemic you have to note what is the lateral or the medial side of the screen and adjust the gain depth and the focus point so you have to know your machine in total when you go do your scans in emergency so if you were, if we talk about probes we have three probes the linear curvilinear and the phased array the linear probe is the you know the high frequency probe and then there's a low frequency probe and then there's a phase array is the one which we use for the scanning the heart but phase array can also be used as a curvilinear probe if you don't have one so for we will talk about it again when we do the scans so what do we scan we scan uh, these uh, five zones we see the lungs we see the right upper quadrant we see the left upper quadrant then we see the cardiac and then we see the pelvis this is how we scan and as uh, you know as you are preparing we have already talked about that you have to adjust the depth and the gain so we should know when we are scanning uh, you know the lung what should be our uh, depth when we are uh, uh, scanning a right upper quadrant we go a little deeper that is why we need to use the low frequency curvilinear probe and so before you do that you have to know the nobology and adjust your gain to see the black and white properly and adjust the depth to see the structures uh, uh, properly so if we talk about the right upper quadrant view so you must pos- you you have, you have chosen this um, probe this is another one which you can use which i have already told you you stand on the right side of the patient and avoid the cables you know criss crossing this uh, this way you can hold the you know cord on the right side and then you should know where your pointer is marking here my student is showing you that the pointer is marking towards the you know head end of the patient and um, this is how it is placed and i'll tell you so when you do the scanning for the right upper quadrant you have to know that you have to place your probe in this in this uh, position and move it caudal and cranially to scan the entire area so when i say you have to place it in this position i mean the anatomical landmark would be the epigastrium at the 10th intercostal space and the mid axillary line so for all the scans you have to identify what will be your anatomical landmark for the right upper quadrant i am repeating it is epigastrium the 10th intercostal space and the mid axillary line and you go and you you know move your probe cranially uh, caudal and then cranially and your sonographic landmarks when you do this uh, scanning from this uh, angle is liver kidney and diaphragm so you make a nicuestic window in which you first scan the liver you identify the kidney and the diaphragm and your area of interest here is morrison's pouch so you can see the liver and the kidney and uh, this uh, bright red line shows you the area of interest so when you scan it the, the right paracolic cutter that is the morrison space this is how you are going to see uh, the view is going to be like this so you see the morrison pouch in between the liver and the kidney and you can see the kidney is beautifully being seen as a double contrast cortico medullary enhancement and uh, sorry and this is the diaphragm 
and since uh, you know air is not a good medium so you can see only the black part here so uh, this is the lung over here so this is the normal expected view to be seen so what happens uh, this is uh, your uh, in in the real uh, you know um, in the live motion i'm showing you with this uh, marker that this is your perinephric area this is the kidney and this is you can identify this as the liver and on the this hand side you can see this triangular and echoic shadow and this contributes to a positive fast the depth you can see is adjusted to 15 cm so this is how your right upper quadrant will look if on the left hand side of my screen if the fast is negative and on the right hand side if the fast is positive so for the left upper quadrant view similarly you are going to the marker is going to be towards the head and your knuckles are going to touch the bed that is because spleen is you know smaller placed more posteriorly and is little difficult to you know uh, see um, vis a vis liver so this is how you are going to make your acoustic window and you have to again uh, rotate your marker i'll just show it to you so <clears throat> again uh, it's the 10th 8th uh, 8th intercostal uh, you know uh, space and uh, mid axillary line so you go from 6 to 9 position you try to you know identify the spleen and the kidney and you also look at the diaphragm and in the on the left side you have to be very uh, you know particular because some part of the fluid gets collected between the spleen and the diaphragm so we have to uh, focus on this area also uh, apart from in between the liver and kidney so what you are also seeing over here is lung mirror artifact and this happens uh, mirror artifact means you see the same image same echogenicity as that reflected by the you know the viscera like the spleen or the liver and that happens when the lung is very aerated and sometimes we do get this mirror effect otherwise mostly you can't see anything because lung uh, air is not a good medium so speaking again anatomical landmark as the eighth in the costal space mid uh, posterior axillary line knuckles on the bed so you can always remember that more to the head more to the bed for the left side the sonographic landmark spleen kidney and diaphragm and the area of interest is the perisplenic space and and the uh, subdiaphragmatic space also expected view uh, we have already talked about it so we we expect some fluid over here we can see and we can also see some collections over the diaphragm so if the patient has any hemothorax or has any blunt trauma abdomen and has collected some fluid between these two you can you are able to identify so scanning uh, uh, if i show you this uh, picture you can uh, have a look uh, this is on the i'm sorry this is the right side which has come this is the positive left upper quadrant fast so you can see uh, this is the this shiny bright hyperechoic is a diaphragm and just below the diaphragm you can see this anechoic uh, you know collection above the spleen and that is the area of interest which is showing a positive fast so for the pelvic space you should scan your patient with a full bladder because bladder is used as an acoustic window and other thing you have to know is that uh, we have to scan in both sagittal and uh, transverse sections uh, so i'll just uh, tell you and uh, you have to fan your probe in the uh, you have to um, make the movement of the probe in the fanning fashion so that you can uh, delve deep into the pelvis and have a look at the fluid in the deep pelvis uh, pelvic structures so anatomical landmark is symphysis pubis or pubic pubic tubercle and sonographic landmark is the bladder and area of interest is recto vesical space in the males and pouch of douglas in females so here you have to remember whom you are scanning the gender part is very important when you are doing the scan for um, pubic uh, this pub, uh, pelvic scan so this is the bladder and this is the rectum and in between which you place space you see is the perivesical space and this is how you form the acoustic window 
female. So, so the here male you have to remember there will be a bladder, there will be prostate and rectum, and this this is seminal vesicles, which is showing some fluid, and this is the expected view. This is the bladder, but here you can't see any uh, positive uh, fast. For the female pelvis, uh, there's this bladder, then this structure is uterus, and you are going to scan this area. And this is a positive uh, fast for a female pelvis, this full bladder, and this structure, which you can, this anechoic shadow, which you can see is fluid. Now comes to the pericardial examination. For the pericardial examination, you are going to select your curvilinear probe and you will <coughs> keep the marker to the uh, to the right side and you are going to make uh, liver, liver as the acoustic window and then you are going to rotate and focus on the left shoulder like how you can see here. So this is the subcost, this is the anatomical landmark, Ziffy sternum, and sonographic landmark is the liver, which then you have to rotate and bring it to the heart. And uh, area of interest we are going to see is the pericardial space, and we are going to look at the cardiac chamber grossly. So pericardial uh, pericardium is seen as you know this bright white light, uh, bright white uh, you know structure. And uh, if you have a look at this, this is the expected view to be seen. And if this is a positive fast, sorry, this is a positive fast where you can uh, see this, uh, you know, there's a fluid in the pericardium and uh, the, you know, the this is called trampoline sign because this is jumping and almost touching uh, the other side. So this is called trampoline sign, this positive fast for pericardium, this pericardial effusion here. So when you talk about extended fast, that is the E-fast, we, we scan the second intercostal space bilaterally. And this is how you play. Here we shift to our linear probe because we are going to scan the superficial structure and you're going to see the shadows of the rib and the beam is going to pass through, uh, it's going to hit the pleura and then some uh, reverberations are going to take place and I'm going to show you. So the anatomical landmark here would be the second intercostal mid-clavicular line and sonographic landmark is the bat wing sign which is formed by the two ribs and there's a pleural shadow in between. So this is the lung tissue, and these are the rib shadows. And uh, uh, this is area of interest. We have to look at the pleural line. Now let's go ahead and see. So this is the normal lung sliding. You can see the pleura, the visceral and the parietal pleura, when they slide against each other, you get this lung sliding, which is the normal uh, sign. I think most of us anesthetists are, you know, very accustomed to doing this scan. And this is uh, one picture which I have taken, which you can, here you can see there is a lung point. So the one side of the sl uh, lung sliding, you can see the other side is there is no movement and uh, the juncture is called a lung uh, point. And this, this is also called ant marching sign because this lung sliding is looking like some ants are marching along. So here we can expect that there is some, uh, you know, uh, some problem and we can apply the M mode and have a look uh, whether there is a, you know, seashore sign or there is a barcode sign. Barcode sign is pathognomonic of a pneumothorax and it calls for immediate attention, like you have to decompress the chest. So if we go back to our, uh, this patient, uh, the patient showed a positive uh, right upper quadrant, fast. And uh, there was there was normal left upper quadrant view, a normal pelvic view, normal subxiphoid view. There was a normal lung scan, and then patient became stable after one liter of crystalloid and one PRBC transfusion. So, so how to infer? To summarize again, uh, the findings of fast. If you have a trauma victim who's unstable and you perform fast, and shows positive you can take the patient to OR, but if it is negative and you have time, now you can take the patient to CT scan. However, if the patient is stable and FAST is positive, again, patient is wheeled in for CT scan to see exactly what is happening. But if it is negative, you can perform serial E-FAST, CT scans or ob observe or cl correlate clinically. Sometimes it rules out some major problems with the patients like abdominal and some 
uh, pneumothoraces and then it, it takes your attention to some other pathology uh, in the patient, like it could be a head injury or something else. So what are the limitations of FAST is it does not localize the injured abdominal organ very specifically. Views may be limited in patients with subcutaneous emphysema and views may be limited in patients who have hollow viscous injury with free air in abdomen because air is not a good medium to scan. So what about the role in critical care of uh, you know ultrasound? Briefly, I'll touch upon this. So we are, all of us are using ultrasound guided resuscitation. We all know that we are measuring inferior vena cava uh, within a few centimeters of entry into the right atrium. And then we are guiding ourselves with some, you know, uh, algorithms like this one, which is, uh, which you, from which you can make out the, like collapsibility and interpret it as uh, CVP findings. The other place where we can use is optic nerve sheet diameter. This is particularly important in head injury patients. If you do not have any access to CT scans, you can quickly perform optic nerve di diameter by lubricate, close, closing the eyelid and lubricating it uh, and focusing on 3 mm behind the globe. Uh, the value of 5 mm is considered to be normal. Anything more than that should raise the suspicion of you know raised intracranial pressure. So uh, patient can be then subjected to uh, the emergency management the other uh, other area where we can scan as um, anesthetist is for air emergency airway management and localization of cricothyroid membrane particularly important for, for front of neck procedures when you have to take immediate access uh, and the patient is desaturating so you can identify the cricothyroid membrane um, uh, uh, using your ultrasound where you can see the air, which is seen, uh, you know, as the black, as the anic, uh, you, you cannot see anything. Uh, whereas the cricoid cartilages, you can see very um, properly. So central venous cannulation against all anesthetists are very, uh, you know, um, now user friendly for central venous cannulation, which is also very important and now considered as the standard of care. Along with that, for confirmation of ET tube, particularly in the times of COVID, like it is also suggested that if you see this uh, double shadow sign, it, you can be, you know, you can think about your endotracheal tube has slipped into esophagus because esophagus, as such, is a collapsed structure. So uh, I haven't touched upon uh, the use of uh, ultrasound for uh, resuscitation because that's a very important topic which should be discussed separately. So I would say that the role of focus in trauma has become indispensable in early as well as later stages of critical care management. And the machine as well as the techniques are advancing and is now the standard of care. So we all must learn the trend and utilize it to its maximum potential. No doubt its pointed care has impacted the patient's safety as well as the outcomes. Thank you very much, uh, audience. And I will hand back uh, to the chairpersons. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kajal, for very nice deliberation, touching to the basics and also what points we have to see for each organ. Because this point of care ultrasound role has emerged. In fact, in the European countries, they have accreditation courses for uh, point of care management of ultrasound. But uh, like in, it is always handy with a clinician who has to treat these uh, problems also at, because you cannot wait for a person to come and do that. So the in emergency scenario, whoever is posted there, primarily who is the leader, he has to have uh, knowledge of uh, uh, using the USG which probe to be used for which area. So that has to be, you have made it very nicely. Uh, cleared the doubts. So, if any, uh, I think a lot of people are there, about 83 participants are there. So, it's very nice for the postgraduates, also for the faculty who are not uh, tuned with the ultrasound to put up any questions with Dr. Kajal. She would be happy to take on to those questions. Thank you, Dr. I think all of us must learn this uh, tool now because um, it's a, it's it, it gives us a, a, you know instant diagnosis, and uh, most of our residents are now doing it uh, routinely, and they're able to you know place the chest tubes, they're able to do some uh, minor you know aspirations, 
and uh, surgical decompressions uh, uh, for pneumothoraces and all so it's very important uh, are there any questions so probably it definitely point of care has improved the morbidity and mortality because the treatment done at the spot by looking into the actual condition it is life saving yeah so sir some one question has come and it has been it's been asked that how would you suggest we do a scan in when patient uh, who's having pain yeah definitely like managing pain is uh, you know a uh, uh, a collateral thing i mean like if the patient is having pain you give a you know some means of uh, managing that pain and you do it simultaneously because uh, there may, there's not much time in trauma bay uh, to you know first do one thing then then come to another one it's all happening simultaneously so we have uh, strong pain killers to take care uh, for such patients who are having pain because as such this e fast is an emergency procedure around the uh, dr kajal it was such an excellent uh, presentation Thank and you. i'm sure uh, the students will gain a lot after listening to your talk uh, just one thing which i would uh, uh, you know tell all the pg students especially that in case they have a negative fast uh, it's not the time that they should be you know relaxed and feel that yeah the patient is fine uh, the repeated fast has to be done in especially if the patient deteriorates so it's a dynamic process and positive fast is uh, uh, you know more uh, important that is yes, patient has uh, positive fast and if is unstable directly go to the oa but uh, negative fast does not mean that there is no injury so that has to be kept in mind by all the students yeah one more small point is that yeah. that since there are many residents sitting in the audience even i encourage my own residents that they should not practice uh, you know uh, doing e fast in emergency scenarios please do uh, make a you know acoustic window in whatever patient you get in your icu so if you see normal it will be very easy for you to see abnormal but if you think that for the first time you are going to learn in emergency room that's that's not very practical so a sincere request to you all that when uh, when you finish your rounds in the morning please scan and try to see the acoustic windows and see the normal uh, you know uh, sonography uh okay so, dr vishal i think if there are no more questions we can wind up this session yes so, sir sir sure sir over to you dr tanveer please carry on sir and i would like to thank the all the committee members so, to invite yeah, all of which peers thank you thank you dr tanveer thank you very much madam thank you thank you i could see all people dr anju grewal menu for titra she was my immediate sr at pgi chandigarh i could see her <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you sir thank you thank dr singhal sir dr kajal ma'am dr babita ma'am thank you ma'am thank uh, you over to you dr tanveer yes, sir dr anju ma'am uh, ma'am ma'am please introduce thank the you. next chair persons and the next okay. thank you uh, thank you all thank you dr kajal dr babita dr singhal and congratulations again to you dr singhal uh, i move on to the next um, uh, session and i invite the speakers for uh, sorry the chairpersons for the session i would like to invite uh, dr tina banson who is an associate professor at pgims rohtak her chief areas of interest are airway management regional anesthesia and obstetric anesthesia and she has been a reviewer of various national and international journals and indeed gives me pleasure to introduce her as the js wilk awardee for the best letter to editor it's an award in the memory of my late father so it has a special emotional bond to me uh, welcome you ma'am for uh, chairing this session she is being joined by uh, dr uh, rakhi goel we are indeed privileged to have you uh, dr rakhi here she is the lead consultant anesthesia at the madhukar rainbow hospital um, new delhi Uh, she has been uh, one of the pillars and she would continue to be one of the pillars of the journal of anesthesiology clinical pharmacology as an associate editor she has uh, had an immense training in pediatric anesthesia from aims from london and also holds a fellowship of the indian association of pediatric anesthesia 
a recipient of the Chief of Army Staff Commendation Award. Um, indeed, a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Raki. You have an uh, illustrious uh, CV, and I hand over the mic to both of you to introduce the speaker for the next session. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. It is yeah, indeed a uh, to be here, and uh, may may I have the privilege to introduce our eminent speaker, Dr. Har Simran Singh. Sure, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah. Dr. Har Simran Singh. He is consultant anesthetist at Portsmouth Mouth Hospital University at United Kingdom. His areas of interest are trauma, regional anesthesia, and acute pain. And he is examiner for European Diploma of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. He has many international and national publications to his uh, credit. Uh, I request Dr. Har Simran for his talk on the topic perioperative analgesia for hip fracture in elderly, evidence-based practice. Dr. Har Simran, please. You need to unmute yourself, sir. Please hello. unmute yourself. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, esteemed uh, RSVP faculty, uh, many thanks uh, for inviting me to have a, a chat about one of my favorite topics about managing uh, a pain in patients with uh, hip fractures. Uh, Dr. Tanvir, could I request you? Okay, thank you. You request. Uh, I just Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tanvir, can you see my screen? Can you see my slides? Uh, your screens are visible. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. yes Thank, you. Visible. Thank you. Uh, I think before I start my talk, uh, uh, there are loads of people I need to thank uh, when I started my career. I think the first of all is Dr. Tej Kekal, who was a professor and head when I started doing uh, anesthetics at uh, the Anand Medical College. Uh, Dr. Katyal, both Dr. Call and Dr. Katyal have been my mentors all through. Um, and then uh, Dr. Anju Garewal, who was my thesis guide. Uh, I can't forget all, all the teaching that she has given me about anesthesia and about publishing. Um, I'm sure ma'am would remember that when I was there, the journal used to be published uh, manually and her whole room was surrounded by white papers and amount of trips we used to had, uh, have to and fro from uh, the hospital to Swami printers. I think a lot of people of my era would remember those. But, uh, but the teaching that it gives you, you don't realize it when you're doing it. It's only when it goes 10 years down the line that you realize uh, how much you were learning in all that process. So a big thank you to Dr. Call, Dr. Katyal, and uh, Dr. Garewal. And, and I'd like to thank uh, Tanvir as well. Uh, for giving me an opportunity to have a chat about it. Okay, so uh, for the next 20 minutes, uh, I'm going to have a quick discussion about uh, neck of femur fracture analgesia. I'll focus more on myself uh, to analgesia. Uh, talking, If you start up talking about anesthesia, it will take much longer. Uh, what are the options? Uh, what is the evidence and what we can do? And then we'll move on to the fascia iliaca block, uh, which is one of my favorite blocks uh, to do. And I'll, I'll um, carry on with that. Okay. So the numbers I have apologetically are from United Kingdom. Uh, I couldn't find, I tried to have a look about the numbers for India, but there is not much discrete data. So in United Kingdom, uh, this is the data from 2014 when we had our last audit, uh, national audit, nearly 80,000 people have a, a proximal neck of femur fracture or a hip fracture. And it is quite a, a serious condition in terms of the mortality. Um, it is one condition in which a geriatric patient, patient is most likely going to come to hospital and also going, going to come to your operating room. And this, this is not without complications. The mortality, overall mortality rate is about 6.1%. This used to be nearly 10% in 2010, and uh, a lot of work has gone in, which has shown uh, an improvement all over the country by bringing, bringing the mortality down from 10 to 
And if you look at these patients, uh, you will always, uh, it, it's strange that uh, I, I was brought up in India and I work up here and I do trauma one day every week. And, and when you see these patients, you just see your own parents and grandparents and them who might land up with these problems. And I think because they can't complain, they can't tell you how much pain they are. It is more of our duty to work more in whichever institution we are in to assess and manage their pain. So what does the NICE tell us about uh, the pain in these patients who already had hip fractures? And there are very clear-cut guidelines or clear-cut things which NICE wants us to do. Uh, they expect us that we assess a patient's pain who has come in with hip fracture immediately on arrival uh, within 30 minutes of giving analgesia and then every hour till the pain is settled. Uh, so what, what are the options we have for these patients? Uh, basically, what we have is an option of giving them paracetamol. We can give them non steroidals and we can give them opioids. And what we are trying to achieve is that whenever they are moved, whether it is for just sitting up, whether it, if they go for an x-ray or while they're waiting their surgery, they just want to have a glass of water, they are not crying in pain. Uh, all these patients are regularly given uh, uh, in United Kingdom according to their weight, if there are more than 50 kilograms, a gram of paracetamol orally or IV. The other two options we have, giving non-steroidals or opioids, are not without risks in this frail population. The risk of having an acute kidney injury in this patient population is nearly 40% in United Kingdom. And with an acute kidney injury, you giving them opioids and non-steroidals will be quite harmful, which leaves us with an option of doing a regional anesthesia, which would give them adequate analgesia without any major side effects. Okay, so my talk included the, uh, what evidence we have and all our practice should be based on evidence. So I'm just going to quickly scroll through what evidence we have that actually doing a nerve block for hip fracture is better than giving them strong or weak opioids. Uh, the evidence we have is in form of randomized controlled trials. In the last few years, uh, there were about good eight randomized controlled trials a few of them who saw pain pre-op, post-op, and a couple saw both uh, perioperatively. And they all confirmed that the analgesia that we get with a nerve block for hip fracture is definitely superior as compared to the analgesia that you will get with uh, systemic analgesia. Uh, there was a a big Cochrane review, uh, which was done in 2018, and it found that the performance of a peripheral nerve block before, during, or after the operation, it reduced the opioid consumption significantly. Um, there's a good quality evidence about the decreased pain on movement and enough moderate quality evidence about decreasing the risk of pneumonia improved mobilization, and definitely decreased cost by decreasing the stay in hospital as well. There's a recent meta-analysis which was published in the BJ in 2018, which found that doing a preoperative fascia iliaca block beneficial for pain control for preoperative analgesic consumption it decree or the time to first analgesic request was delayed. So these are the benefits for the, for the patient. And then there is a combined benefit for both patient and the anesthetist. They actually found that the time to perform a spinal anesthetic, if you are performing a spinal anesthetic for their operative procedure, was also less if you have done an effective nerve block to take care of their pain because you could easily get to them in a better position without requiring any other opioids or using propofol or ketamine, all would have harmful effects for their delirium. 
So the authors concluded that the, doing a fascia iliaca block is an effective and relatively safe supplement in the preoperative analgesia for hip fractures. Uh, so all this data has been uh, recently collected, and just last month, the the AGBI, the Association of Anesthetists in Great Britain, have come out with a guideline for management of hip fractures. So this is quite recent, just published, uh, I think, last month, and they have got four characteristic points for us, which is which is that every patient should get a single shot nerve block. So every patient with hip fracture should get a single shot nerve block in the emergency department. And then perioperatively, while they come to OR, if you've had six hours passed between that, uh, you can either do a femoral or a fascia iliaca, but obviously doing a fascia iliaca block is better because it can also cover the incisional pain. It does talk about ultrasound guided placement, which will improve the accuracy. I'm really thankful to Dr. Jan, who's just given a very nice talk and covered the basics of using ultrasound. And I'm basically going to build my lecture subsequently on that. And uh, peripheral nerve blocks should be routinely used to supplement a general or a spinal anesthetic. So if in theaters you're doing a spinal anesthetic for them, it is still useful to give them a nerve block because of all the evidence that we have seen. Okay, so now we'll move to our main topic or, or what, what we can do with regional anesthesia to help these patients. Uh, so we'll talk about doing a fascia iliaca block. So you can do a fascia iliaca block just by a landmark technique, which was first described in 1989-1990 as a three-in-one block, or you can use an ultrasound-guided fascia iliaca block. Uh, what I always tell to my trainees or wherever we have developed a service is that not having an ultrasound in the ED shouldn't stop you from doing a landmark fascia iliaca block. It still has got a good 60 to 70% success rate of blocking at least the femoral and the femoral nerve and the lateral cutaneous nerve of the time. Uh, before we move to the block, I think it's very important for us as anesthetists to understand the in innervation of the hip joint. Uh, so, Anteriorly, if you look at the anterior part of the neck of the femur and the capsule, it gets most of its nerve supply from the femoral and the obturator nerve. But posteriorly, it also gets some of its nerve supply, especially the posterior capsule from the sciatic plexus. So it does have nerve supply from both lumbar and the sciatic plexus. And that's its osteotomal nerve supply, which is causing the patient pain. And when they come for an operation, then dermatomal nerve supply also becomes important. Uh, so if you look in, in, the, in here, so that gives you an idea about what kind of incision they're going to have for which surgery. So if they're going to do a hemiarthroplasty, the skin incisions are more proximal, pro approximately this area. Whereas if they're going to do a dynamic hip screw, then the skin incisions are a bit more inferior. And the whole of this part of the lateral part of the thigh is supplied by the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Okay, coming next to the landmark fascia iliaca block, it's a simple block technique which all of uh, all, all registrars should start doing right in the first year. In United Kingdom, we have even trained uh, our nurse practitioners and ED practitioners to do it. Um, the most important thing: make sure that. Uh, you have reviewed your patient. If they can give consent, you've consented your patient. You make sure that you're doing the correct side. You stop before you block. That's another massive initiative that we have initiated here. Before putting your needle in, while you sprayed, waiting for the antisepsis to work, make sure you confirm the side. You have your adequate monitoring there and you have... Uh, um, uh, your uh, trolleys just in case you land up with a complication of intra-arterial intra or intravenous drug injection. Okay. So or if you imagine this is a patient's leg, so that's superior, that's inferior, that's a lateral part of anterior superior alex spine. You draw a line even for the first few one, there is no harm in that, but you draw a line between anterior superior alex spine, pubic tubercle, draw the line and divide it into three equal parts between the medial and the middle thirds, uh, about two centimeter uh, uh, posterior or caudal, you have your needle insertion point. Use any blunt needle 
and you will feel a double pop the first pop is normally the fascia lata the second pop pop is the fascia iliaca after you've had your second pop aspirate and you will need to inject about 30 to 40 ml of local anesthetic we'll talk about local anesthetic what you inject um, subsequently so you have your fascia lata and you have a fascia iliaca so you are injecting local anesthetic between the fascia iliaca and the iliacus muscle and it spreads around to definitely in a uh, numb or block your fem- your femoral and the lateral cranial nerve of thigh and in about good 50 to 60% it reaches to block the obturator nerve as well coming next to ultrasound guided fascia iliaca block so uh, as dr jan was just telling that uh, ultrasound has moved most eds and a block done by ultrasound is more reliable and the risk of complications are much lesser so you can do an infrainguinal fascia iliaca block or you can do a supraingual fascia iliaca block an infrainguinal fascia iliaca block is done basically in the inguinal crease where you look for the femoral nerve pattern and put some local anesthetic in whereas a supraingual fascia iliaca block done is done in with a your probe probe pointing more towards the pelvis and you put you're injecting local anesthetic in this direction uh then we can you still hear me uh, i've lost the time so when i when when i have 5 minutes left can you let me know sorry i didn't start yes, my sir. stopwatch sure sir sure sure yeah. um okay coming next to the equipment and things that you need before you need to do your fascia iliaca block uh we in we in united kingdom do most of our stuff now with an ultrasound machine okay uh, we tend to use the the blunt needles uh, but whatever needles pejunk uh, son, uh, sonocyte whatever needles are best available uh, even if if you have uh, a tuhi needle that is available that's fully acceptable for this block and if you're putting in a catheter which i will talk subsequently you can just use a normal epidural kit to put a catheter here as well I will quickly go through the infrainguinal fascia iliaca block first. Uh, so again, ergonomically, you are standing towards the side of the patient. The probe placed in the inguinal crease, and you tend to get an image like this. Okay, so that's the medial side. That's the lateral side. So you got your femoral vein here, which we don't need to see. So it's it's out of the picture, and you got your femoral artery. and then you have your femoral nerve here and then you've got your iliacus muscle sitting all the way here and just covering the iliacus muscle is your fascia iliaca so you introduce your needle laterally from the side of the probe in plane you got a linear probe here and the needle is going to appear from this side of the screen you move in here and you put some local anesthetic between the fascia iliaca and the iliacus muscle okay so the next technique which which i quite like and has got some recent evidence to be better than doing an infrainguinal is a supraingual fascia iliaca block so in a supraingual fascia iliaca block what you are looking for is putting local anesthetic between the iliacus muscle and its fascia which is pointing towards the pelvis with an objective of rather than injecting local anesthetic in this direction because your hip is fractured somewhere here and with an infrainguinal fascia iliaca block you're putting local anesthetic in the wrong direction for that for a hip surgery you want your nerves of the articular surfaces to be blocked as well and it makes more sense and there is more evidence that you inject local anesthetic towards the lumbar plexus so that you get a better spread and involvement or blockage of the nerves okay uh, so back in 2013 when i was doing my fellowship uh, we described this r glass pattern after the supraingual fascia iliaca block was described by hebert in 2011 and we still find that this r glass recognition makes it much easier to do a supraingual fascia iliaca block uh, coming next to that is there any evidence that doing a supraingual block is better than an infrainguinal block there is a loads of paper coming in but in just in rapm there was a very there have been a couple of good quality studies so this was a volunteer study in which they find found that doing a supraingual 
uh, fascia iliaca block had a much more consistent spread towards lumbar plexus and it was uh, a, a volunteer study with a infraguinal block done on one side and a supraguinal block done on on the other side which gives us a, a, a pretty good understanding of how the local was spreading and found that a supraguinal block does give you a more consistent spread now there's another paper published in regional anesthesia pain medicine which found that doing a supraguinal fascia iliaca block does lead to a more decreased morphine consumption after a total hip replacement surgery okay so coming next to that how we do our supraguinal fascia iliaca block it's quite challenging when you start doing it because as an anesthetist we are quite used to looking around arteries to find our nerves so whatever we are doing with ultrasound whether we are doing a supraclavicular block or we are doing a femoral nerve block we are doing a popliteal nerve block we always look for an artery whereas for a supraguinal fascia iliaca block all you look for is a pattern recognition of muscles but that's what we are expected to do if you're doing a fast scan in ed now there is no reason we can't do a, a supraguinal fascia iliaca block so our aim is to find a pattern like this where you have an hour glass kind of figure sorry where you have your sartorius laterally you've got your internal oblique medially and they are sitting over your iliacus muscle which is covered by fascia iliaca okay so ergonomically very important you have your ultrasound in the correct place so if suppose my registrar Uh, uh, is, is having his op. So we're doing a block on the right side. So you start on the, you stand on the right side with your um, ultrasound machine pointing right in there. So you, all you do is look up and down to make sure that you get the best ergonomics. Okay. So start with your probe placed right over the anterior superior iliac spine. Okay. That's an easy landmark. You can easily find it. Just put it on the anterior superior iliac spine, and what you expect to see is a sub. Is, it's subcutaneous. So you see your hill-like uh, um, bone, which is your anterior superior iliac spine. Once you see that, you have your probe pointing midway between umbilicus and zephyr sternum, and all you do is move your probe medially along the inguinal ligament in the same plane. And once you just move it medially. till the time you start seeing a pattern like this the other characteristic thing is that the midpoint of this r glass this this tr two triangles meeting your sartorius and internal oblique always sits above the ilium bone hair that's another way to recognize it then then you always have your deep circumflex iliac artery which is just sitting between your internal oblique and the iliacus muscle the needle insertion again it in plane needle is inserted from inferior to superior and if you would imagine that this is inferior and that superior so the needle will be inserted through sartorius and it will come and pierce this fascia iliaca hair okay just just before i show you the block video just to correlate anatomically again with this r glass uh, pattern recognition so if you have a quick look at the the sagittal pl uh, plane that has been cut in so you got your sartorius muscle which is inserted in the uh, from the anterior superior iliac spine you got your internal oblique muscles you got your iliacus and that's your fascia iliaca and because your probe is sitting here you see this r glass by your sartorius and internal oblique muscle okay so after you get this view all we need to do is get the needle from the inferior side so that's your sartorius that's your internal oblique you start you start seeing the needle appear from the inferior side okay so you once you enter through the sartorius and you're moving towards the fascia iliaca which is here when you just pierce this fascia just by newton's third law you always tend to overshoot so bring your needle back a tiny bit maybe like half a millimeter and then you just inject 1 ml and the minute you see this lens appearing it shows you you are in the right plane because you're you're basically peeling the muscle of its fascia so that's just another mill 
it's important to keep the needle in the hydro dissected local anesthetic that you have created so you are always safe i'm just injecting some local anesthetic keeping my needle in that local anesthetic i'm creating and my end point is the point where i see the deep circumflex iliac artery you never go any any further than that and then you, as you would imagine in 3d this local anesthetic is now moving towards the the pelvis to catch the nerves of the lumbar plexus and again the similar kind of thing that i pointed out earlier that the midpoint of these this r glass always sits over this this actually if you remember from your anatomy is your anterior inferior iliac spine or you can just remember it as a part of ilium so you got your sartorius internal oblique your needle pushing some local anesthetic in just over the ilium and the local anesthetic goes towards the lumbar plexus uh if you have so in in united kingdom we have an aim that uh, we get all our neck of femur fractures operated within um 36 hours but if you have a patient who due to some reason cannot have surgery then we quite like putting a fascia iliaca catheter in you can just use a simple epidural catheter um and uh, that that can give them analgesia for 24 to 36 hours till the time they are ready to getting ready to be um operative for their procedure and if you look at the trajectory of this block Uh, there are no big arteries there are no big nerves so if you have an anticoagulated patient uh, i would still have a very low threshold of doing it i'm not worried of causing any nerve damage because i'm at least an inch away from both femoral and the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh so this block gives me a medium of putting local anesthetic around all three nerves of the lumbar plexus without being actually close to any of them uh so this picture is is the other way around so this this is uh, superior this is inferior and i was just talking about you always see your deep circumflex iliac artery so you've got your internal oblique you got sartorius you got iliacus and your deep circumflex iliac artery uh so in summary just just summarizing what we've already done uh, very important to have your monitoring if you have intralipid available you should at least know where it is kept have the proper equipment you need uh, local anesthetic wise we tend to use 30 to 40 ml of quarter percent so that's 0.25% uh, levobupivacaine uh, but even if you want if you are using your fascia iliaca block just before a spinal anesthetic then i do tend to add some lidocaine in it because then it hastens the onset and helps me to get the patient in a much better position much earlier always think about your think about your ergonomics develop a policy to always do a stop before you block not only for fascia iliaca but every other block you do um just a quick clinical pearl about uh, if you're still doing a, an infraguinal fascia iliaca block the one we saw discussed about initially make sure you have your single femoral artery because if your femoral artery is divided your femoral nerve is divided as well so make sure you're you are proximal enough so that the femoral nerve is single i quite tend not to uh, have my needle or or do not do the infraguinal nerve block because i am not pointing towards a femoral nerve block if you look at the closed claim analysis for regional anesthesia you know when things have gone wrong have people have put in claim all over the world there are two blocks that are notorious for it interscalene and femoral nerve block and one of the reasons that i quite like to stay away from the femoral nerve block is that it's very prone to get injured while you are doing a femoral nerve block uh whatever block you are doing always remember to put a doppler on first because there can be inadvertent blood vessels in every block you do aspirate every 5 minutes and then make sure you monitor your patient after you've done your block uh, for at least half an hour do we have 10 another 5 minutes tanvir i don't know yes sir please do okay so if you want to refer back uh just give me a second uh i do have a small video which is which is available on youtube which is one of the videos that uh, i've put on while i was doing some teaching it's quite basic if you look at it so it was not aimed for anesthetic trainee it was actually aimed for the eg and the ed interns 
uh, I can just quickly play that for you, and then you'll have a much much better idea. You won't be able to hear the voice. So I've got. Uh, uh, he's one of our best ODPs in theaters. Uh, so just trying to show you how to do a fascia yucca block. So let's go back. Okay, so I've put my probe. You see an anterior superior alex spine. Okay, and all I'm doing here, if you have a look here, is I'm just moving the probe medially along the inguinal ligament. So the probe is pointing midway between umbilicus and the sternum. I'm just moving the probe medially along the inguinal ligament in the same angle. And if you have a look at the screen, suddenly you start seeing this pattern appearing. So on the left side, you have your internal oblique, you've got your sartorius, and always in the midpoint, you have your anterior inferior alex point. And there'll be a deep circumflex alex artery somewhere here. So if I was blocking for him, you just bring your needle from here and put some local anesthetic in. So the needle comes from inferiorly here. You just pierce this fascia and put some lo local anesthetic around there. Okay, uh, coming next to setting up a provision of a fascia iliaca block service, wherever you are, uh, whichever hospital you work, I think it's extremely important if you don't have a provision to set it up, uh, make sure that you uh, do some work, set up a, a quality improvement project, um, set up a service, have some uh, tick boxes for your registrars that they understand the anatomy, they understand the ultrasound, they understand the local anesthetic pharmacology, um, they have the knowledge of uh, picking up the symptoms of local anesthetic toxicity and how would they manage it. So that, that would be something else to like a good project for the trainees who are listening. It will be, if you want to come here and work in a different country, doing audits and quality improvement projects is really important. And I find this a very easy project that could have an immense effect on the quality of anesthesia you give. This last couple of minutes, uh, a few years back, uh, we had uh, uh, an, an, an observation or, or an, is, uh, an issue of a, um, from a Royal College of uh, Emergency Medicine of a patient who actually had a death after fascia iliaca block. So the other thing to realize is that if your patient after, say, a total hip replacement or after a revision hip, is in extreme pain and they have already received multiples of opioids, including morphine, and they've got a, a bit of acute kidney injury. And then you do a, a supraiguanal fascia iliaca block that is going to take away the pain completely. And it's not uncommon for that patient to be breathing at the rate of four. And if, if you're not monitored because of the circulating opioids they have, they could easily have a respiratory arrest because you have taken their a source of pain away. Okay, uh, so in summary, I think analgesia for hip fractures is really important. It's a it's a core topic for my heart, but uh, it's very important that all our patients, uh, elderly patients who come to hospital with hip, hip fractures, get pain relief. Uh, ensure it is given. Be very careful that uh, you don't use non steroidals or or use your non-steroidals and opioids carefully because they can call, they can easily cause harm in this patient group. Uh, fascia iliaca compartment block provides very effective analgesia and it is definitely worth setting up a service in your emergency department and theaters. Uh, I've left some time to take questions, so if someone wants me to go through anything else, I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Har Simran. It was really totally flawed. I'm a big fan of uh, regional blocks, but uh, today I think you have taught us something new, something which is effective and safe. And uh, I really love those uh, uh, pearls of safety that you have taught. Now, uh, the practice in India is uh, very, uh, I wouldn't say very different from the UK, but uh, we work in different setups, you know. We have government hospitals, we have uh, private hospitals, we have smaller setups, larger setups, different levels of teaching. So here it is even more important that people follow what you've just said, you know, the safety, the monitoring, the approach uh, and what you're best with. 
So I think uh, your talk uh, would benefit a lot of people and uh, especially the supra-inguinal uh, approach to uh, uh, the fascia iliaca. I, I'm totally flawed and tomorrow I promise I'm going to find a volunteer and not yeah, put in a needle because yeah. that's the easy part, but find the R glass and I'll report back to you that I did. Yeah, now, sure, in the chat box, there are lots, sure. lots of uh, accolades for you. People, uh, you know, less questions and more uh, people have uh, praises for you, except for uh, one or two questions. They want to know the position, the amount of drug. And I think that's fairly simple. You showed us that's a supine position. Ergonomics you showed, but you can, you know, tell them again, if uh, let them hear it from you. Sure. And the amount of drug, uh, both with I'm ultrasound and without ultrasound, that would be great. Uh, so I'll just play from current slide. Okay. So ergonomics wise, I think this answers all the questions. So probe is again about a, about an inch, a centimeter and half and a half from the anterior superior alex spine, pointing this way. The machine, the screen is in front of you. Uh, the needle goes from inferior to superior. It appears through sartorius. A drug volume is again same. I tend to put 30 mils or 30 to 40 mils depending on the patient's uh, weight of uh, 0.25. It's, it's a field block. So you want to give them a lot of volume. So you never need anything more than quarter percent uh, uh, marking. That's the quarter percent Bupiva cane that we have in India. Uh, and the interesting question you asked was about uh, at places where they don't have an ultrasound guided fascia, ultrasound. Uh, I think it is still worth just doing a landmark fascia iliaca block with a blunt needle. If you actually look at it, you know, the way we have just talked about the landmark fascia iliaca. So that's your anterior superior alex spine. That's your pubic tubercle. And if you divide this three line into three parts, the point of needle insertion of a supraingual fascia iliaca block is not hugely different where you were doing your landmark fascia iliaca block as well. So a landmark fascia iliaca block in thin patients do have a good 50, like good 70% efficacy of catching both femoral and lateral cranial nerves. So even in those settings, do remember to just put a landmark fascia iliaca block. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, and I think I'm totally with you that uh, the blocks where you don't have to, you know, go around an artery or a nerve or a plexus of nerves, it's very safe. You know, poking yeah. in a needle where you know there is nothing in your way, I think it's really safe. And, uh, and then ultrasound, you know, makes it yeah. safer by locating it well, giving less amount of drug. So it layers of safety it adds. And one thing we started many years back and I still follow is the last protocol. I have those printouts put next to the places where we are likely to give blocks because we are not the only ones who give blocks. You know, a exactly. lot of surgeons, surgery residents, their junior residents. And a lot of times I have seen, especially in the ER and in a busy theater, they give uh, unsupervised you know, unfortunately, they're unsupervised and they have no idea about LAST. Uh, so I think uh, spreading the awareness about LAST is uh, our responsibility as anesthetists and we should do it. So no, thank you. you. Uh, thank you so much. It's really nice. And you, you know, you, ex you took your time to explain a block, which is so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you, Chairpersons, for uh, conducting the session so well. Thank you, Harsimran. It's been an excellent talk. We have ha we do have a few more okay. questions. Uh, we do have. A, I can. Um, I think I can squeeze in one question that's been asked repeatedly. If you allow me, Doctor Raki, um, and that's because yes, the peng block. Yes, please. Peng block, and one of my students please, is also doing a yes, thesis so on this. The so peng block. There has been actually some. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So there has been some recent evidence just a few days back about paying block and uh, hip fracture uh, and analgesia 
after total hip replacement surgery. Uh, we have done a few of them, most for our uh, elective patients having hip arthroplasty rather than a neck of femur fractures. But that's again, is it's a different, uh, I'm more than happy talking about it someday, but it again takes, it will take at least half an hour if you want to explain that block properly. So I'm more than happy doing it on a different day, ma'am. Sure. We'll love to have you again on doing that uh, talk again to us. And thank you so much, uh, Chairpersons you, and uh, Dr. Harsimran, for such a lucid and interactive session that we have had. Uh, this structure would like to thank uh, our technical support guys, um, Dr. Ashok Shyam and Mr. Rahul Chaube. We are also streaming live on Anesthesia TV. So a huge amount of thanks to all of you. All of you. And uh, with this, we move to the next session. We have uh, a wonderful session and a talk by a very dear friend, Dr. Sheila Maitra. And to introduce her, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Um, Vivek Gupta and Dr. Atri to chair the session. Dr. Vivek Gupta is the senior consultant, cardiac anesthesia and intensive care at the Hero DMC Heart Institute, uh, Ludhiana. He's also the secretary of the Ludhiana branch of RSACP. Mm -hmm. Area of interest are ECMO. Um, he's indeed the ECMO uh, person, one point reference for us uh, during our COVID era and been doing it very successfully. Uh, renal replacement in ICU and quality in healthcare systems. He has been a chairman of the Research and Ethics Committee and um, also been on the Southwest Asian African chapter of the Extra Corporeal Life Support Organization. Uh, I welcome you, Dr. Vivek, to uh, introduce um, our speaker. I also take this opportunity to introduce Dr. J.P. Atri, who is a professor of anesthesia at the Gurnanak Dev Hospital, Government Medical College, Amritsar. He has uh, in, an, around 62 publications in national and international journal, a recipient of the YG Bhojraj Award for 2012 Best Review Article in the Indian Journal of Anesthesia, uh, a profilic uh, speaker and also a member of the editorial boards of various journals. Uh, welcome both of you and would uh, request you to take over the mic to introduce Dr. Sheila. Thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. It's my proud privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Sheila Nayanan Matra. Uh, she's a professor of anesthesia at Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And uh, her area of interest, we all know that's the airway management. She is the president of All India Difficult Airway Association. Other area of interest are hemodynamic monitoring, ICU sedation, and infection control and end of life care. She has more than 100 publications in the index journal. And besides this, she is the chair uh, person of intensive care and critical care medicine committee of World Federation of Society of Anesthesia. She is going to discuss a very important topic. Um, emergency airway management uh, in trauma triage. Probably this is one of the um, nightmare for the anesthesiologist when we come across with the polytrauma patients and we have a problem with the airway. So over to Dr. Uh, Professor Sheila Nandmatra. Uh, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Good evening to all of you and greetings from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital and also from the All India Difficult Airway Association. I'm going to be speaking to you about emergency airway management and trauma uh, triage. Uh, before I start, I'd like to for, uh, I'd like to mention that for a lot of us as anesthesiologists, we're always uh, thinking about anatomical difficulty and airway management. I mean, this is what we've been taught. You have to get the tube in somehow. And we're always thinking that will it be a difficult airway? And uh, what are the things that I should assess in terms of anatomical difficulty? But please understand that when you have a trauma victim, of course, you can have anatomical difficulty, but these are critically ill patients. They have bleeding. They come with hypotension. They can have airway trauma. They can have chest injury. And they are also hypoxic. And uh, they constitute what we call um, patients who also have a physiologically difficult airway. So if we focus just on the anatomical difficulty, uh, you know, we may get into a soup and we need to think about the physiologically difficult airway. So this is how we usually go around about, uh, you know, securing the airway of a patient, pre them, induce anesthesia, give a muscle relaxant, mass ventilation, laryngoscopy and intubation. Remember that these patients have a physiologically difficult airway. 
Most of the time, they may be hypotensive. A lot of the time, because of the sympathetic drive, there's tachycardia, hypotension, and you may uh, get a false sense of security that this is fine. And we've all seen it in trauma patients. The moment you induce them and you lose this drive, there is precipitous fall in blood pressure. So the point I'm trying to make that these patients are a vulnerable group of patients who are at a higher risk of developing complications. And we need to take certain precautions in these patients uh, considering this physiological difficulty. So we should keep in mind that these patients have a physiologically difficult airway. And in addition to this, if they also have anatomical difficulty, then it further increases the chances of uh, complications. And we need to uh, you know, treat this as a special vulnerable group of patients, especially during the airway management. Now you all know about your advanced uh, trauma life support. There's airway breathing circulation, disability uh, exposure, et cetera. Now what we focus on is the airway and the breathing. Um, but I'd like to also tell you that this has to happen in conjunction with the other aspects, because when you go to intubate, you know, when it's about airway management, it's not about directly passing the tube. Airway management begins as soon as you approach the patient. So it's important before you do your airway management that you ensure that the patient has been adequately resuscitated and various aspects of circulation, disability, exposure, all this has been taken into consideration. So it's not that A is airway. So your first goal is just to put in the tube somehow. Because if you do this, you might get into, uh, you know, you might ignore a lot of other physiological aspects that need optimization prior to air management. In terms of airway, you need to evaluate the vocal response. You need to look for airway obstruction. This is extremely important. Uh, and this is, of course, in addition to the other uh, checks that you will do. You need to inspect for any facial or laryngeal fractures and suction the oropharyngeal contents, especially if there's vomitus, bleeding, etc. Uh, auscultate the patient, inspect and palpate the chest wall, percuss the thorax, use pulse oximeter, provide oxygen throughout. And we've had a very good uh, talk just now on regional anesthesia. And I would say use the ultrasound, do a lung ultrasound, look mm -hmm. for any pneumothoraces, look for any collapse. So this is very important that you do a very thorough examination. And this is some additional things that you should specifically look at in trauma victims. Now, what are the predictors of difficult airway in uh, trauma patients. So these are some specific considerations that you should keep in mind. Now, if you look at just difficult laryngoscopy and intubation, so you might have someone with limited mouth opening, there may be jaw displacement. Uh, so, you know, you might have a collar that's making it very uh, difficult uh, when you're using manual inline stabilization. So you open the collar and the earmuffs during the manual inline stabilization, stabilization and I'll talk about this in detail, or inability to position uh, this patient so uh, this is especially a time when your bougie and video laryngoscope come uh, particularly useful and your external laryngeal manipulations. Blood and vomitus is something that you have to take, keep in mind. Remember, they may be full stomach, delayed gastric emptying. So you should have at least two suctions ready. And I'll talk about the salad approach, penetrating or blunt injury, so disrupted or distorted airway. And this is extremely uh, important. We need a rapid sequence intubation in these patients. You may need video laryngoscopy. And uh, then coming to what can constitute a difficult mask ventilation. So uh, sometimes there may be limited jaw thrust that may make this difficult. You may have a poor seal because of facial injuries. Uh, there may be blood and vomitus again over here that might make this difficult, penetrating blunt or neck trauma. So these are things that you may want to consider if there's difficult mask ventilation, if feasible, of course. Early use of a supraglottic airway device. For blood and vomitus, you should have a strong suction. And uh, then you may be in a situation where there's difficulty in uh, supraglottic airway device uh, insertion. And this can particularly happen when there's blood and vomitus or penetrating blunt trauma. Okay, so here again, if you have a full stomach and delayed gastric empty, then keep your suction ready. And if there's distorted or disrupted airway, there may be a case for doing an early tracheostomy. And remember that you may sometimes need to do a much lower tracheostomy than you usually do. And penetrating of blood neck trauma. Now, this is one area where you shouldn't try to be uh, very hemorrhoidic and you should straight away, especially when there is disrupted airway or the cricothyroid membrane is not accessible or there's no inju uh, there's injury below uh, the cricothyroid membrane. These are cases where you should think of doing an upfront tracheostomy and consider doing a lower tracheostomy. So these are specific things related to airway management, which you should consider can result in a predict a difficult airway. 
Now, considering the physiological difficulty, now this is a score that is specific to critically ill patients, but I thought it would be important for you. I'm sure you've heard of the Makocha scoring system. And this Makocha stands for the Malampatti. It stands for the uh, apnea syndrome. You have uh, cervical spine limitation, mouth opening, coma, hypoxia, and also the anesthetic non-trained. Now, you know, in many emergency departments where trauma patients are, it may not always be uh, anesthesiologist present. They may also be physician intensivist present. So this is a very beautiful score that takes into account not only the anatomical difficulty, but it also takes into account the physiological factors. For example, the patient being comatose gives you one extra point. If there's severe hypoxemia, there's one extra point. Even if there's a non-trained, there's a non-anesthesiologist that further increases the risk of airway management. So one extra point, the maximum score is 12 and it moves from zero to 12. So this is a very good, as you know, it's very difficult to do a proper airway assessment when you have a trauma victim who's just come in and you have to uh, secure his airway quickly. So this is a quick bedside evaluation you can do and this Makocha scoring system has been validated in critically uh, ill patients. So this is uh, something that you can use uh, quickly at the bedside. I'd like to highlight some strategies that you can use in these patients uh, to improve your uh, outcomes. Now, most important is the preparation and the planning. It's very important when you're doing airway management, you have to ask yourself uh, specific questions about the airway management. And this, of course, if you have, now, is this a difficult airway? Is it going to be a difficult mask ventilation scenario? Again, highlighting what I already showed you in the table that it may be sometimes just an anticipated difficulty airway or it may be just a mask ventilation that's difficult. Now, what medications and maneuvers should be avoided is very important in trauma patients. Is this intubation high risk due to an elevated intracranial pressure? This is the question you should ask yourself because then the strategies will be different. Is this intubation high risk due to threatened cerebral perfusion? Is the cervical spine unstable? So these are questions that you should ask. And I would say the most important thing is team preparation. And team preparations, we have evidence to support that you need the presence of two operators. Don't try to secure this airway again. This is a high-risk airway management. So try to have two operators and preferably one should be experienced in airway uh, management. Use checklists. Make sure that you have, if you have a checklist in your unit, make sure that you've gone through it. At the time of securing the airway, you realize that your bougie is not there, something else is not there, and then people are running around getting it. So if you have some time for preparation while you're adequately pre oxygenating the trauma victim, you can use a checklist. And this is a good way to keep things ready. Clear communication. Now, this is very important. Among your team members, you should highlight what are your airway concerns. Okay, I'm worried this patient may aspirate. Uh, you know, I'm worried that I may have difficulty in mask ventilation. I'm worried that neck rescue in this patient is going to be difficult. So uh, talk about the airway concerns. What are the specific airway concerns that you have? What are the other concerns? I'm worried about hypotension after induction. So it may not be specifically an anatomical uh, consideration. And then discuss that if this happens, what is my airway plan? First, what is the plan? Am I going to do it awake? Am I going to do it asleep with relaxant, without relaxant? Are we going to use a video laryngoscope, a five bronchoscope? Am I going to use a video laryng uh, a direct laryngoscopy? So what is your airway plan? What is my backup plan? So what if this fails? If this doesn't happen, what are we going to do? And what are the roles and responsibilities of the team members? So this is extremely important. We spend a lot of time on the strategy of airway management, but I think the team preparation prior to airway management is extremely crucial. And if you have time, this should be something that you should focus on. Now, routine positioning. Now, this is routine positioning. I'm not talking about patients who have a cervical spine injury. Uh, this may be patients with just stress trauma or patients who are uh, hypoxic. They will benefit if you give them a little bit of a ramped up position because this gives you more superior pre oxygenation Patients who come who are very hypoxic, critically ill, if you see, they, they have, it's very difficult for them to lie flat. If you see someone who's uh, coming, who's very uh, short of breath, he'll always be sitting and move, bending forward, right? Flat position is not a comfortable position uh, for a patient who's hypoxic. So if they're like this, they were better in ramped up position. And you try to uh, align the um, um, you know external auditory matrix with the sternal notch. And in this position, also uh, in this kind of ramped or propped up position, you will see that you are able to pre oxygenate better because the posterior aspects of the lung also can be collapsed areas can get uh, better 
uh, oxygenated. So there are different strategies that you can use for pre-oxygenation. So earlier we used to just do conventional oxygen therapy, but now we have more tools in our armamentarium, and this is pre-oxygenation using non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula oxygen. I'm sure you all know. Of course, for these two techniques, there are contraindications. If you have a skull base fracture, if you're a patient with full stomach, you know you may not be able to use this. But in the vulnerable group of patients who are at a very high risk for deterioration and hypoxic. Uh, hypoxemia. These are two strategies that you can consider. Now, what is the evidence um, to use this? And including uh, not only pre-oxygenation, but also apneic oxygenation, uh, considering that these have patients have a physiologically difficult airway. And in addition, if they have an anatomically difficult airway, we would like to use apneic oxygenation to prolong the safe apnea time. Just in case we have a difficulty uh, in intubation, we don't want the patient to uh, desaturate at the time when we're trying to secure the airway. So um, now coming up to pre-oxygenation, again, if they're brain injured patients, head injury patients, you should know about the effects of hypoxia and hypoxia on brain physiology. Now, uh, although the therapeutic uses of hyperoxia have been used to describe uh, most more notably in traumatic brain injury, many neuroscientists believe that uh, supra physiological levels of oxygen provided to acutely ill patients may actually worsen the reperfusion injury and the outcomes. So hypoxia, uh, we know, uh, may be an important cause of secondary brain injury, and the injured and ischemic brain is particularly vulnerable to low levels of oxygen. Now, considering this, we need to give 100% uh, oxygen to these patients um, with head injury for pre-oxygenation. And of course, later you can wean to 50% post-intubation and then use lower FiO2 in order to make the saturation between 95 to 100%. You need not target 100% saturation. But it's important to pre-oxygenate even this group of patients really well. Now, um, this is an old study, and this is about the benefits of non-invasive ventilation for pre-oxygenation. And when I say non-invasive ventilation, we are talking about uh, you know, using the uh, face mask, you have a ventilator circuit, patient is spontaneously breathing, but you're using pressure support and PEEP, not just oxygen therapy, but you're using a bit of PEEP along with this. So this is a study that's compared NIV as for pre-oxygenation uh, for, uh, you know, versus conventional oxygen therapy using your non-rebreather bag while mask. And what did they find? They found that when they pre-oxygenated using this NIV, that is pressure support, uh, along with about five of PEEP, they found the saturation after pre-oxygenation, there was no difference. However, uh, the fall of saturation during tachyl intubation uh, was, uh, you know, much uh, lower in patients, you know, saturation was much higher in patients in the NIV group. And also the incidence of saturation going below 80% during tracheal intubation was lower in patients who got uh, pre-oxygenated with a non-invasive ventilation group. So definitely in the high-risk population, those who are vulnerable to hypoxia, you should consider non-invasive ventilation for pre-oxygenation. Of course, uh, there should be no contraindication for using uh, either high oxygen or then I mean. Now, uh, Coming to uh, high flow nasal oxygen therapy, I'm sure all of you are uh, used to this uh, therapy, and this can be mm, used in several patients. It can not uh, patients who present with acute hypoxic respiratory failure following trauma, and sometimes this may also be help you tide over a tracheal intubation. The patient may not need a tracheal intubation, and in, so it's a good idea to start the patient on this because it, you can use it for pre-oxygenation. And uh, it's difficult to give them, uh, you know, you can go up to 70 liters of flow, but don't start with 70 liters of flow. You use 100% oxygen, start with 30 liters. And then as you, in, if you're going to do tracheal intubation, as you induce the patient, you can go up further on the uh, flows and then you can go up to 70%. Of course, this heated humidified uh, oxygen that we're using because we don't want, it won't be tolerated well by these patients if we give so, such high flow of dry oxygen. The benefit of this, unlike NIV, is that you can pre-oxygenate with high flow nasal cannula oxygen and you can continue the high flow nasal cannula oxygen during attempts at intubation. So these are the two, um, you know, more advanced, I would say, uh, techniques of pre-oxygenating the patient, uh, especially those who have atelectasis, you know, chest trauma, some other conditions where they are hypoxic and they are very vulnerable uh, to desaturation. You can consider this provided, of course, there should not be any uh, contraindications related to any upper airway trauma or anything of this sort. Now, have they been compared head-on? Uh, 
You may be aware of the Florali 2 study. This was done in France. This was a multicentric trial where they compared high flow nasal cannula oxygen, uh, which was used for pre oxygenation and then continued during a temp set intubation, that is, as apneic oxygenation. And they compared this with using non invasive ventilation. Now, what was the result of the study? Uh, and the primary outcome was uh, the episode of saturation falling before below 80% during intubation. And if you look at the primary outcome, there was no difference between NIV or high flow nasal uh, cannula oxygen. However, in the subgroup of patients who had a PAO2 FIO2 ratio less than 200, non invasive ventilation was superior. Uh, mode of pre-oxygenation as compared to high nasal cannula oxygen. So I'm just telling you about these uh, different techniques of uh, pre-oxygenating patients, especially in the vulnerable group of patients who are very hypoxic. And I'd also like to just allude to this one study. Uh, and this is a very nice study called the Optinif trial that is a proof of concept study and something very futuristic. This is done from the group of Samir Jaber. And what they've done is that they've combined both non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula oxygen. So they've done a very smart thing. They pre oxygenated the patient. This was a randomized controlled trial. Of course, in a small group of patients, proof of concept study still needs to be validated. They pre oxygenated the patients with non-invasive uh, uh, ventilation that is using pressure support and PEEP. And then they continued apneic oxygenation using high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And they compared this with using just non-invasive ventilation alone. And they found that a combination of these two was more superior uh, to uh, just using pre-oxygenation using non-invasive ventilation. So it's something to think about, uh, something uh, futuristic. And this is a review that we just recently published last, I mean, last year in uh, intensive care medicine. And we looked at all the non-invasive respiratory support that you could give these kind of patients who are coming with acute hypoxic respiratory failure and also trauma victims. And you can see that definitely high flow nasal cannula oxygen is superior. This is in pre-oxygenation to conventional oxygen therapy. Uh, between high flow nasal cannula and NIV, uh, it's debatable in acute hypoxic respiratory failure. As far as tracheal intubation goes, NIV is superior to high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And this is in patients with moderate to severe hypoxemia. Uh, we should continue apneic oxygenation wherever it's feasible. And mask ventilation uh, should be done, especially in the vulnerable group of patients uh, who are at a high risk of getting hypoxemic. Uh, I'll just uh, come to the other aspects. So that's about pre-oxygenation and how you could optimize your pre-oxygenation in this vulnerable group of patients. Now, as you know, trauma victims, they are uh, likely to be in hemorrhagic shock, hypovolemic shock. So we need to avoid hypotension in these patients. And when you're trying to do airway management, induce this patient uh, itself, you can um, uh, further precipitate uh, the hypotension leading to arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, a lot of complications can occur in trauma victims. So of course, you're going to give volume support, vasopressors, etc., to mitigate this. But uh, in trauma victims, the primary goal of induction should be to maintain adequate hemodynamic stability. And you provide an adequate level of pain control. And this has already been discussed. Amnesia is very important. And uh, securing the airway promptly in order to avoid secondary uh, injuries related to hypoxia and aspiration. So these are the concerns that you have in trauma patients. You're worried about pain. Uh, a lot of times, because there's hypotension, you tend to give less anesthetic agent to this patient. So lower dose of anesthetics are often given. You know, people try to give less dose of, uh, you know, just a little bit of midazolam or they give half dose of induction agents, etc. because they're worried about the hemodynamic instability. But awareness is a big concern in this group of patients. And also, they are at a risk for significant pain for their other injuries. So these have to be kept in mind uh, during airway management. And of course, these patients are um, considered as full stomach because you don't know when they would have had their last meal. So uh, but the default is usually, uh, if you're planning to give general anesthesia, is usually to conduct a rapid sequence uh, induction in these patients. And regarding drugs, now again, considering uh, that these patients are very vulnerable to uh, develop hypotension. Now, ketamine is a drug that's not really something we use in anesthetic practice in the operating room, but it's found its way into the emergency department where there are trauma victims and the critically ill patients. And the reason is because these are cardiostable drugs, ketamine, etomidate. And this was a uh, paper in Lancet that compared head-on ketamine with etomidate 
and this was a practice changing paper an old study uh, almost 655 patients and they compared these two drugs for induction uh, for during rapid sequence intubation they didn't find any difference in the sofa scores no difference in intubation condition but more patients had adrenal insufficiency with uh, use of ketamine and a more recent study and this uh, compared uh, ketamine and atomidate for induction during rapid sequence intubation and this was in adult trauma victims almost 1000 patients and they found that patients induced with ketamine had icu more icu free days ventilator free days and hospital mortality and this was similar to patients in, induced with atomidate so the real message for this is that the default induction agent should be ketamine or uh, atomidate unless it is contraindicated for any reason and even in patients with head injury i remember when i was a, a trainee uh, we used to be told oh icp is raised so don't use ketamine but today we use ketamine uh, even for uh, head injury patients now um, cardiovascular collapse very common complications in the in these patients and it's very interesting because to avoid this hypotension you give a lot of volume to this patient and this is a very interesting study that is conducted in Vanderbilt University and almost 400 patients and they uh, you know gave either fluid loading or no uh, fluid bolus at all and interestingly they found no difference in the incidence of cardiovascular collapse compared to when a fluid bolus was given in these patients this is of course after you've uh, you know stabilized the bleeding and you've take have control of that and you've given blood and things like that i'm saying uh, once you've stabilized the patient and ready for induction there's really no benefit they found of giving a fluid or this so perhaps there is a role of starting vasopressors early even in trauma patients and this needs to be uh, evaluated further now very very important is the agitated trauma patient now be very careful about this agitated trauma patient who you are trying to intubate okay so this is a patient who needs to be preoxygenated well and this is the patient in whom preoxygenation is most challenging so agitation remember may be a symptom of traumatic bohodish ilavia bohodish ilavia hello so agitated patients may uh, require facilitated cooperation for preoxygenation and ketamine is a very useful drug and i'll come to this in a bit uh, to facilitate this cooperation in agitated patients and remember when you give this ketamine you must always be prepared to have a definitive airway intervention and i'll come to how delayed sequence intubation is extremely important in this patients especially in trauma patients where a lot of time you have an agitated patient you try to induce this patient very quickly you don't preoxygenate them well and then they have uh, hypoxia so you must try to mitigate koi lama jaa tab so you can use koi dia samajh aa raha hai koi dia uh sorry mm-hmm. yeah so you could use ketamine to facilitate the preoxygen so what is delayed sequence intubation now this is a technique that is used in this kind of uh agitated patients and this is to facilitate preoxygenation so you can use ketamine to facilitate the preoxygenation so you know this is a vulnerable group you know these patients are usually hypoxic they're very agitated you give them sedation doses of ketamine not induction doses sedative doses and ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic it preserves the an- airway reflexes the respiratory drive and the blood pressure so in patients in whom you fail to oxygenate you sedate them using ketamine about 1 mg per kg of ketamine and then you will be very easily able to preoxygenate them and it's after the niche wala hoga teen ja rahe hai na wahan pe ki meri awaaz wahan pe kaise uh sorry <laughs> i think okay now after you do this preoxygenation then you can decide whether you want to do a rapid sequence intubation sometimes you may not even need to intubate this patient after this preoxygenation uh you may uh, consider you know you just no need a tube at all or you may even consider doing a wake intubation but whatever it is in the agitated patient consider giving doing a delayed sequence intubation consider giving ketamine to facilitate uh preoxygenation so this is a technique we've started using more and more now in the critically ill patients but i think it's really useful because i remember earlier when we used to get these agitated patients we used to just try to knock them down and there wasn't enough time for preoxygenation uh coming to rapid sequence intubation a lot of people debate or oh, should i do it it's a wake or should i just you know should i give a relaxant what if we lose the airway so rapid sequence so there's these are old studies but they've shown that there's there's no debate about this we need to do an rsi uh especially in uh, if this study very beautifully shows that with or without muscle relaxant people are afraid to give muscle relaxant so if you look at the complications 
any of the complications you look at and look at the p value uh, you know the significantly higher in patients in whom muscle relaxant was not used so definitely a rapid sequence induction mm -hmm. intubation significantly reduces the complications of emergency airway management and this should be used of course by physicians who are trained to uh, use this uh, technique and uh, about neuromuscular blockade what should be used uh, definitely, this is a more recent study that again showing that no neuromuscular blockading agent versus neuromuscular blockading agent. Definitely, the risk of complications was lower in patients in whom neuromuscular blocking agent was used. And when they compared the different agents, and this is from the group of John Sackles in the United States, and they looked at succinethonium and rocuronium. And uh, as you can see, there was no difference in the first pass success or the CL grading or the POGO score uh, when uh, rocuronium or succinethonium was uh, used. Of course, when you use uh, succinylcholine, you have to be uh, cautious about the contraindications for its use. Uh, if uh, you have any of these conditions, you should avoid using succinethonium and you can consider uh, using uh, rocuronium uh, instead. Now, um, during RSI, bag mass ventilation, now you have this trauma victim, there's always this perceived risk of aspiration, even in a critically ill patient, or the patient may not be fasted, and you're always worried about doing uh, bag mass ventilation in these patients. However, there's a vulnerable group of patients who are at a risk for hypoxemia. So there is this perceived risk of aspiration, and on the other side, they need mass ventilation because after you induce apnea, they're likely to desaturate. So um, this is the first study, and this was in NEGM, the very big paper that came last year from Jonathan Casey, where they've compared, done bag, gentle bag mass ventilation during tracheal intubation. So you know that these patients desaturate very rapidly, and uh, they will, uh, you know, have complications related to uh, hypoxia, arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, etc. And on the other side, you have the risk of um, aspiration. So you have to balance the two. So in the vulnerable group of patients, you can consider gentle mask ventilation. And this is what Jonathan Casey did. Uh, he gave gentle mask ventilation during uh, you know, a rapid sequence situation versus no ventilation at all. And uh, of course, uh, in the group of patients who received the gentle mask ventilation, uh, they were the saturations were uh, much higher in these patients. And there was no increased risk of aspiration. This study was not powered for aspiration, so we cannot say that you know in all patients you must give gentle mass ventilation, but definitely in patients who are at a risk of hypoxemia, this study gives you the confidence that you can consider gentle mask ventilation during rapid sequence intubation to avoid hypoxemia. Coming to the tools for intubation, now video laryngoscopy, excellent device in the into or, uh, operating room and we all use it and there's enough meta-analysis to show that video laryngoscopy increases first pass success. The first meta-analysis that was done outside the operating room, uh, uh, it showed that video laryngoscopy was superior to direct laryngoscopy in terms of first pass intubation intubation success, uh, and it also reduced the incidence of visceral intubation. However, uh, you know, there were more incidents of arterial hypotension. So first pass success was high, but hypotension was more. So complications were more. And if you look at the um, meta-analysis, uh, which was done in critically ill patients, uh, and this was a systematic review of um, uh, nine randomized controlled trials comparing video laryngoscopy versus direct laryngoscopy in this critically ill population. Unfortunately, the results aren't as promising as you see in the operating room. And that's quite surprising, right? Because you would expect uh, that in the ED, in the ICU, video laryngoscopy would fare much better. And the reason for this is not the anatomical, uh, is the reason for this is the physiological and difficult airway. You have an excellent uh, view and you tend not to abort the attempts at intubation, obviously, because you get a nice CL1 view when you use the video laryngoscope. And you tend to go on and on trying to intubate this patient. And we have to remember that these are vulnerable patients who are at a risk. They have physiologically difficult airway and they rapidly desaturate during attempts at intubation. So the complications may be, it's not the device that is at fault, but perhaps our uh, techniques and our training uh, needs to be enhanced. And probably this will uh, def better define the role of uh, video laryngoscopy future studies in critically ill patients. And Professor Samir Jaber has beautifully summarized this, that video laryngoscopes, they are a heterogeneous ent entity. Most of the studies that have been done in these kind of critically ill patients in ED and ICU uh, have used different, different scopes and, um, you know, not very high quality uh, RCTs. And they've shown that um, definitely this provides a difficult uh, improved glottic view and is very useful in uh, difficult airway management. 
you cannot say that you should routinely use we don't have enough uh, evidence today to recommend the routine use of video laryngoscope in all patients but definitely a very powerful tool to resuscitate uh, difficult airway management and future tri trials will better define the role of uh, video laryngoscopy in into this care but the excellent teaching tool and it's very good because your assistant can watch what you're doing and also guide you during uh, intubation now this is the driver study a very important study that has come recently which is published in jama effects of buji versus uh, an in endotracheal tube with a stylet so what they did is rather than just go in with the laryngoscope they either use the buji up front or they use an endotracheal tube which was already preloaded with a stylet and this this were patients which had at least uh, you know um, one characteristic for a difficult airway and this was during emergency intubations as you see in trauma victims and what did they find now uh, they found and their primary outcome was first attempt intubation success in patients who had difficult airway characteristics and what they found that in patients in whom a buji was used uh, the success rate was much uh, significantly higher compared to an endotracheal tube uh, with a stylet Uh, of course, it was a single center study, and it was criticized because this was a center which was very experienced with buji use. Nevertheless, it tells us that in patients in whom uh, you have um, experience with using a buji, perhaps there is a role for upfront using a buji in this vulnerable uh, group of uh, patients. Another big problem in trauma victims is the contaminated airway, and I'm sure many of you would have seen this. You're trying to do laryngoscopy, patient is bleeding or is vomiting, and you know, so you can use what we call the salad approach. That is a suction assisted laryngoscopic airway decontamination. That is what salad stands for. And uh, you know, alternate approaches, options for hemorrhage. You know, you can control it either with sutures, packing, epistaxis kit. You can use different things because sometimes the blood is coming in your way. Uh, minimize your positive pressure ventilation. and i uh, try to identify the epiglottis that so this is a very important landmark because if you can identify this you can quickly slide your buji uh, and you know you can be prepared for this and this is one place where you know, video laryngoscopy or bronchoscope remember blood and secretions are the enemy for any uh, video assisted techniques so they may not score well so even if you are using a video laryngoscope try to use one with a macintosh blade so that you know just in case um, uh you know if there's a lot of contamination you can do direct laryngoscopy while uh suctioning the patient so this is like how you use the uh, the salad technique so one of the ways of doing it you use a wide bore suction to initially de uh, you know decontaminate uh the patient perform laryngoscopy you keep the blade superior against the tongue away from the fluid and then you advance your suction into the uh, upper esophagus and then wedge it and place it on the left side so you need a very good nice powerful suction Wedge it on the left side of the laryngoscope, and you can also use a second suction if needed. You rotate the laryngoscope blade thirty uh, degrees to the left to open this blade channel, and then you can place the endotracheal. So essentially, what you're trying to do in these patients which have a a lot of secretions, a lot of vomit, a lot of blood, this kind of uh, you know salad technique of uh, doing suctioning while you're doing. Uh, the laryngoscopy and tracheal intubation with a very good powerful suction can be really effective in uh, trauma victims when you face this uh, problem now when you have uh, you know in uh, head injured patients when you're concerned about elevated intracranial pressure you can blunt this icp rise of course with associated with uh, laryngoscopy using various uh, agents and sympathetic drugs like esmolol um if there's no c spine injury you can maintain uh, the head up position briefly uh, in this position while especially while preoxygenation if necessary and maintained in the and you can even have the patient if necessary you can maintain him in the reverse trendle mode position throughout the uh, intubation and of course i cannot highlight the importance of adequate uh, maintaining the blood pressure and oxygenating these patients throughout because this is a vulnerable group of patients you are worried about brain protection you are worried about the raised uh, icp Now coming to the intubation of a patient with the unstable cervical spine polytrauma patients uh, you know when there is known or suspected c spine injury so any patient who confirmed or suspected c spine you place them uh, place them in a stabilization device and during the intubation the manual inline axial stabilization of the head and neck by the assistant is extremely mandatory you need an assistant of course for this for doing the mills and uh, remember the special effect precautions you need to take mask ventilation with extreme caution okay now cervical subluxation could occur during your uh, you know chin lift uh, and jaw thrust bag mask ventilation it could occur during tracheal intubation as well as maneuvers such as head turning so be extremely careful when you are suspecting c spine injury okay 
uh, try to be very gentle with any of these maneuvers, even mask ventilation. No cricoid pressure, as this can cause posterior displacement of the cervical spine. And this is one place where video laryngoscopy is really excellent and should be used up front because you're uh, limiting, you know, the movements. You want to keep the patient in neutral position, and you could use a video laryngoscope. Uh, uh, for these patients and use it along with a bougie or a tube with a stillet. Now, just a word about manual inline stabilization, and you should have your assistant to do this. Now, this is uh, very, very important as to how you do it. Now, there should be full, uh, you know, with the mandible uh, should be free, the range of movement. There should be free range of movement of the uh, mandible. So what you see on the left side is the incorrect uh, position. This is not the correct way to do it. And what you see on the yeah, right side is the uh, the correct position. Your palms, they cover the ears or what you call the ear muff approach. And the mandibular range, you should, there should be full free movement, the full mandibular range of movement. There should be free movement. Okay, this range of movement should be uh, completely free in these uh, patients. So it's very important that you perform correct uh, manual inline stabilization. Otherwise, not only could it be um, dangerous in terms of the C-spine, but you can also make your airway management difficult. And if you have any collars or anything that you've used that is obstructing your view, of course, you need to uh, remove them and give manual inline stabilization. A little on the effects of pH, uh, your PCO2 and pH on brain uh, physiology. And this is, of course, in head injury patients. So when the cerebral autoregulation is intact, the PCO2 only plays an important role in determining the cerebral blood flow. So hyperventilation resulting in hypocarbia has immediate effects, as we know, on arterial vasodilatation with increased cerebral uh, blood volume, and this can increase the ICP. So hyperventilation with hypocarbia results in uh, arterial vasoconstriction, decreases cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume and decreases ICP. But having said this, unless your patient is really coning or something like this, uh, hyperventilation is not really recommended. But you should be aware of this, in, uh, especially in patients who have had head injury. Now, I'd like to show you this slide, and this, this uh, always reminds me about airway management uh, in trauma. I worked for several years at Sion Hospital, and, um, you know, it was Asia's largest trauma center. So we used to get the worst of patients. And I used to always think as an anesthesiologist that we have to secure the airway somehow for these patients. But remember, when you have these kind of patients uh, with a lot of maxillofacial trauma, and uh, you, you have to have a very good assessment that do I, am I really going to intubate this patient? This is a very important question you need to ask yourself because every patient may need every support, may need every management, but it's not necessary that that is through intubation. And you should be extremely careful because these kind of patients, it will be very, very dangerous anesthetizing them. Any awake technique with all this bleeding is going to be terrible. So remember that you have to consider doing an awake tracheostomy in these patients. And you should know no, when to say, no, I'm not going to intubate this patient. I'm going to let my surgeon do uh, an awake tracheal intubation, uh, an awake uh, tracheostomy. And that is probably the safest approach for a lot of tracheal uh, trauma patients who present like this. And this distinct, uh, discretion is very, very important. I like to end with a, a very nice um, kind of algorithm, which I saw in recently in the anesthesiology clinics and uh, for trauma victims. So you have a patient who requires intubation and uh, important, as I said, a lot of times they are uncooperative or they may be cooperative. The question you need to ask yourself, is there a suspected difficult intubation, airway, suspected airway injury? Is there a C-spine injury or some neurological difficulty? So this is what you need to ask yourself. If this is the case, you could consider an awake uh, into flexible bronchoscopic intubation. Of course, if feasible, you may even consider doing, I would say, an awake tracheostomy if you feel that these conditions are there and you have a surgeon at hand uh, very quickly. If this is, or you could give a one go at an awake technique, and if it's unsuccessful, of course, you go directly to a surgical airway. Now, if you don't have this difficult airway or airway injury and anything like this, then you could move on. You could definitely consider uh, anesthetizing this patient, uh, pre oxygenating, as I mentioned. You can give precord pressure, and this is when you don't have so spine injury. And you could do a routine RSI. Again, in RSI, I've already highlighted that you could consider gentle mask ventilation uh, in uh, these patients, especially those who are, um, uh, uh, you know, at risk for desaturation. Consider ketamine, using ketamine and uh, using muscle relaxant and gentle mask ventilation. 
if you are unsuccessful of course get hold of a senior person i mean this probably should have already been around you if you're in this vulnerable group and then you can uh, use different techniques you can use your um, you know change your blade change your device use a buji use a video laryngoscope if you are not successful with your dl if you are unable to intubate these patients move to a laryngeal mask airway again these are patients who don't have c spine injury and um, uh, other uh, suspected airway injury if your ventilation is successful then you have a supraglottic airway device in you should consider intubating through the supraglottic airway uh, device using a flexible bronchoscopy do not blindly try to intubate through the supraglottic airway device get someone with who is experienced in doing that if this has been a difficult airway and if this unsuccessful of course you should consider moving to a surgical airway so this is just a, a simple algorithmic approach to airway management in a, a trauma victim we should consider the important points i'd like to say is you should know when to do on a wake tracheostomy in these patients not every patient needs an endotracheal intubation consider using ketamine to facilitate preoxygenation because this is extremely important and sometimes may even tide over the requirement for an intubation um this is just a recent review that i wrote in cover an opinion uh, in critical care which was published in january on air management in the critical ill and i've highlighted all these things that i've talked about as to how you could optimize these patients and this is our paper that's just published last week in jama where we talked about where we looked at intubation practices across the globe uh, adverse peri intubation intub uh, events and i was very uh, fortunate to be the co pi on this uh, study and what a lot large proportion of these patients were trauma victims and interestingly when we looked at the peri intubation events if you look at um, cardiovascular instability was the highest com it was not hypoxia as much as cardiovascular instability in these patients and that's very obvious in uh, trauma victims so the point i'm trying to make is don't rush to intubation optimize the physiology of this patient give fluids give vasopressors give adequate preoxygenation don't rush to intubate this uh, patient and um, this is a very nice review that's published of course in 2018 but from george kovacs a very good friend on air management in trauma and i would urge uh, you to really read this because i found this review very very uh, informative and uh, very uh, interesting i'd like to end by saying that air management in uh, trauma begins as soon as your patient walks through that makes contact with you and the success is dependent on shared understanding of the importance of resuscitation before intubation so this is extremely important as i mentioned don't rush to intubate give adequate time for preoxygenation patient is uncooperative give him ketamine give fluids give vasopressors anticipate physiologically difficult area anticipate that this patient is at a risk of hypoxia this patient is at a risk of hypotension and try to use various measures that can mitigate this risk uh the other important thing is you must consider the special oxygenation hemodynamic icp control of course in head injured patient maintaining your cerebral blood perfusion and also cervical spine stability these are very uh, important specific consideration in uh, trauma victims and use a video laryngoscope and buji early especially when uh, optimum position cannot be uh, given so there's a good role of using video laryngoscopy and remember that this life saving procedure tracheal intubation that you're doing can actually turn into a life threatening procedure if it is not uh, managed appropriately thank you very much uh, for your attention i hope you all have a safe airway thank you uh, excellent presentation dr sheela uh, you covered the topic very well uh, considering almost all aspect of the airway management i'm seeing few questions in the chat box before asking those those question i i would like to ask one question where do you fit a role of ecmo uh in these uh, trauma triaging patients where we are not able to secure air right so definitely um you know we are using more and more of ecmo now and many centers uh, have ecmo and are uh, experienced to use it but then um what i would say is ecmo of course we would use as a last resort if you're just not able to secure the airway and you you know but ecmo is not easy you need to have your cannula in it takes time so it's something that you can keep in hand ready if you are anticipating this kind of problem but you have to have a plan and a full preparation for it when you were a trauma victim in the emergency department you're not going to have ecmo absolutely ready so in some kind of patients you know uh, with um, you know like really bad chest trauma really you know the kind of patients who are very hypoxemic very you know if you have the preparation and you have the infrastructure to do it definitely there is a a, a role of uh, 
Yeah. yeah, actually, I would like to add one thing in this. Uh, you said rightly that uh, anticipation first, then we anticipate that there is going to be a problem. Yeah. So securing a five French sheet in that situation, using a, both the femoral veins, probably can be a life savings uh, in this situation. You can use for two reasons, uh, two ways, one for rapid fluid infusion and vasopressors, as well as any time if you need uh, uh, place, replacing it with the whiteboard cannula, it becomes very easy. Because if you have your team in place, within seven, eight minutes, you can go on VV ECMO and probably you can save a crashing patient. In fact, hemodynamic uh, stabilization will also take place because some component of hypoxemia is adding in the hemodynamic instability. Right, so that's actually said, um, you know, the key is that you need time for this. Yeah. You know, because if you would do the ECMO, you just can't, it's not like doing an emergency cricotherotomy. You yeah, need time true. to put that cannula in. But so you it, it as a last resort. Planning. Yeah, if you don't have, I uh, you don't have any other option. Probably that can be life saving in some situation. Okay, and we have few questions in the chat box. One question is: Would you recommend delayed rapid sequence intubation for a trauma victim in ED? Yes, of course. This is like routinely practiced uh, uh, and advocated, especially in the United States. They use it a lot in the emergency departments. Uh, so these kind of hypoxic, agitated patients, what which who we tend to just knock down. They give them sedative doses of ketamine. They pre oxygenate them very well because once you give them uh, ketamine, for those who use ketamine, you've seen that you know you don't produce respiratory depression and your patient is cooperative and you, you're able to pre oxygenate them well. So, a delayed sequence intubation is practice, and then after that, you do your RSI. But uh, this helps you uh, pre oxygenate these patients very optimally. And I've started doing this a lot in critically ill patients because earlier, what we used to do is when they come very hypoxic, our goal is to just get the tube and get the tube in. But they have precipitous fall in saturation if you don't pre oxygenate them well because you have very short safe apnea time. They are very vulnerable. So this uh, is a technique that you can use uh, and I've started using it more and more in critically ill patients. I don't do trauma now, but this is something we can use. Yeah. Another question, probably you have already answered it, but the question is, can keto fall be considered for rapid sequence intubation? Uh, yes, there are all these studies with you know combining the two techniques. Yeah. See, essentially you have to understand one thing, that when these patients come, you see them not always hypotensive. They've been resuscitated, but there's often that tachycardia and hypotension that can be hypotension that can be very misleading. And this is why propofol, which we use, uh, is a beautiful agent in the operating room in stable patients. Uh, when you uh, you know they have these patients are intravascularly depleted, and it's just a sympathetic drive keeping that blood pressure out, up. So the moment you induce them, the moment they visit, they have precipitous fall in uh, blood pressure. And this is the reason for the hemodynamic instability and the cardiac arrest, that a, a high incidence of cardiac arrest, almost 3% in this group of patients. In addition to this, after you intubate them, if they're already hypovolemic, and then you give positive pressure ventilation, again, this decreases the further decrease in the preload and cardiac output and further fall in blood pressure. So all this makes them very vulnerable to hypotension. So make sure you optimally volume resuscitate them. And in addition to that, use cardiostable agents like uh, ketamine and uh, etomidate. You could use combinations, but I really don't know evidence to show that, you know, ketofol is one is superior to the other. So what's important is um, adequately volume resuscitate them and use a cardiostable agent. Don't use agents like propofol. Uh, there are a couple of questions which are showing concern about use of PEEP, especially in case of hypotension and uh, in a patient who is having full stomach trauma patients. Using, uh, what is that? Uh, PEEP, positive and expiratory pressure. So will it be safe? Yeah, so uh, PEEP, uh, are you talking about before intubation or after intubation? Uh, before intubation, because uh, we had discussed like that. You, like I told you, that uh, when you're giving both NIV as well as high flow nasal cannula oxygen, when you're using NIV, I told you pressure support and PEEP. Again, you have to be selective. If you have... Uh, uh, both for high nasal cannula oxygen, if you have skull base fracture, if you have patients who just had a full meal and come, I mean, you have to be a little selective. These are awake patients, they're spontaneously breathing, they tolerate it very well, but you have to be very careful about which patients you're using, especially. Yeah, probably it should be more individualized, I believe. Uh, indiv definitely, yeah. yeah, you hit the nail on the head. It has to be individualized, but I'm saying, you know, it is a balance between the risk of aspiration and the risk of hypoxia. So uh, if you feel the risk of hypoxemia is more, you need to pre -oxygenate. You think you're going to induce this patient and he's going to desaturate very rapidly. Well, I would pre -oxygenate them. So you have to uh, be uh, very careful about how you're uh, using this. And remember, when you're using high-flow nasal cannula oxygen, only if the mouth is closed, you get PEEP. 
So yeah. you get about four to seven of peep, and uh, if you really want to preoxygenate very optimally in very high risk patients who are at risk for hypoxemia, NIV is more superior. Remember this. So it again depends on your patient, and uh, the choice of. Uh, I was just trying to tell you compare the three techniques, and like you rightly said, you have to individualize. Uh, there is a risk in everything, but you have to see that which is more uh, dangerous to do. and which may be more suitable for the patient and you have to individualize of course yeah because ultimately it's the body physiology which has to be maintained and how it is being maintained this we have to see Absolutely. another question uh, is status of selex maneuver and back mass ventilation in rapid sequence right Intubation. so again <laughs> that's a whole lecture on its own so selex maneuver has yeah. been much debated yeah. definitely not in patients with suspected uh, c spine injury oh. i already mentioned uh it should not be practiced whether it's of any benefit if you see all the guidelines well selic maneuver is included in guidelines of critically ill patients as well but much debated and people don't even do it properly so uh and you know that the jama study showed no benefit so it's something debatable but definitely not in c spine injury uh if anybody has any other question or comment I believe Dr. Babita uh, wanted to make a comment. Is she there? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, yeah. Just couple of comments I wanted to make uh, regarding the RSI. The Selex maneuver uh, still has a role in uh, trauma patients, including cervical spine injury. Uh, there are a lot of cadaveric studies uh, which showed that there's minimal uh, movement in the cervical spine with Selex maneuver. However, if there's any difficulty, uh, definitely uh, the selex maneuver can be released. The required pressure can be released for intubation because definitely airway uh, takes precedence over uh, manual and line stabilization. So, uh, so over the uh, selex maneuver, so uh, it can be released. Uh, secondly, just for students, I would like to uh, uh, add uh, that saxa methonium. colon which is being used for rsi uh, in difficult airway we always think that uh, colon uh, the, the action is not long lasting and if there is difficult airway and we are not able to intubate the patient will come out of colon and we can intubate but they have to remember that in a trauma patient who is hypotensive uh, the patient may not come out of colon so uh, that has to be kept in mind uh, in a trauma patient Uh, regarding airway equipment uh, whether it is video laryngoscope or fiber optic intubation whatever one has to do in a trauma setting uh, one has to be trained in that particular uh, equipment in a normal setting uh, rather than doing that procedure for the first time in any emergency setting including video laryngoscopy uh, still many majority of us Uh, would be using uh, i'm not talking about premier institutes across the country majority of them would be using direct laryngoscope and that is the method they should be following in acute trauma setting so uh, these are few things uh, which i just wanted to add and uh, definitely as ma'am said supraglottic av device can be used but again it has to be converted to a definitive airway as soon as possible in a trauma patient Uh, who needs uh, further care? Even uh, either he goes to OR or ICU, wherever he's disposed. But we need to have a definitive AV, uh, even if we have inserted LMA for AV management. So regarding the tracheostomy, uh, there's uh, enough uh, literature which mentions that there's no role of uh, surgical tracheostomy in a trauma patient in again in acute emergency setting. It's the Uh, surgical cricothyrotomy or needle cricothyrotomy which is recommended and that should be done in case of any emergency airway management and that is to buy time and of course later on uh, 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 whatever airway management has to be done a definitive airway has to be secured it should be done so these are few points which i just wanted to thanks add thanks for asking the points i just like to clarify i didn't mean uh, Emergency airway management is, of course, cricothyrotomy. It's not surgical uh, tracheostomy. Yes. The point I was trying to make is that if you have a trauma victim and you have to secure the airway and you have time, it's not necessary that you have to intubate every patient. You have yes, to know that some patients need an airway tracheostomy. So this is, of course, when you have time. 
when you have when your your patient is in a cannot intubate cannot ventilate situation complete ventilation failure there's no question that it's emergency cricotherapy and regarding cricoid pressure i'd also like to say not only when you have difficulty in visualization another important thing is when you're inserting a supraglottic airway device also you shouldn't give cricoid pressure you should release the cricoid pressure cricoid pressure whether you should give it or not is a separate debate in adult patients itself it's been debated and the jama studies shown no benefit so again additionally if you also have c spine injury i'm not sure a lot of people don't advocate its use but again whether you should use it or not is uh, something that's debated thank you so much uh, dr sheela for such an you know well covered topic and well covered talk i would say you really did it very well and i think one of the most important take home messages of uh, your talk for post graduates who are there around uh, around us is that please don't rush to intubate you know just take a step back as ma'am said uh, prepare uh, assess prepare and then of course you know decide what is more important for this so airway management necessarily doesn't mean always intubation that's i, I believe is the biggest uh, key message that you have given us thank you so much for joining us despite for me having Mumbai, I would say, having such a bad day, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. With care, and I wish you all safe uh, times ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vivek, for Thank you, uh, conducting Thank you. it so well. I uh, would like to move on to the next and the last uh, most awaited uh, session, and for that, I would like to invite a chairperson. uh professor dr menu panditra uh, who is a professor at um, the adesh medical college uh, medical institute at batenda she has an area of interest in oro and uh, oro maxillofacial and uh, trauma and orthopedic anesthesia and she has uh, a good number of around 50 in publications in, in index journals welcome ma'am to this session you are being joined by dr tripad bindra dr tripad bindra joins us from um just a second she joins us from um, patiala and that's my hometown so welcome tripad um she's a professor there uh, at uh, the government medical college patiala our areas of interest are trauma and obstetric anesthesia she is a wonderful <laughs> acls um, and bls instructor uh, often joins us in our courses and has set up the covid icu at the rajendra hospital patiala welcome dr tripad um, and i hand over the mic to both of you thank you Thank you to be part of this webinar. And I'm extremely thankful to you and the organizing team. Now the uh, last and the most uh, awaited and the important talk that is the best practices for the management of uh, blunt trauma chest. That is uh, that will be delivered by Dr. Dikinder Kaur Makkar. She is a professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care, PGI Chandigarh, and is a co-faculty of BM Trauma and Acute Care in PGI, with a special interest in uh, uh, regional anesthesia and pain management. She has over 100 national and international publications to her credit, with Best Paper Awards in 2014 and 16, and a Good Quality Publication Award also from the PGI Chandigarh. So it's my privilege uh, to introduce Dr. Dipinder Kaur Mathur for this uh, enlightening talk. Please. Not here. Then you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Doctor Jit, yes, ma'am. You are. I I have been able to. I'm sorry. My apologies. I probably missed that step. Ma'am, please continue. So, 
should i go back now uh, so by you know i am uh, so to begin with trauma is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the hospitalized patients that fall in the range of first to fifth decade of life so it is a major health problem that affects the earning age group the people who are going to earn the money for the country so around 1 lakh 30000 people die because of trauma in the developed countries and when it comes to Okay. Yeah. So when it comes to data from India, most of the data from India comes from uh, accident registry, and it has been seen that roadside accidents account for twenty two point eight percent of the total trauma patients. India loses two to two point five percent of its GDP in management of road traffic accidents, and so trauma is the neglected disease of modern day country. So chest wall trauma, chest wall trauma involves trauma to the chest wall as well as the trauma to the thoracic cavity. It can be of two types. It can be the blunt trauma. It can be the penetrating trauma. So today we are going to restrict. ourselves to the blunt trauma topic which constitutes around 75% of uh, chest wall trauma so motor vehicle accidents represent the most common cause of blunt thoracic injury among emergency department so there are several factors which are responsible for high incidence of thoracic trauma blunt thoracic trauma after roadside accidents and this is attributed to high speed not wearing a seat belt extensive vehicular damage and steering wheel deformity if all these four for for uh, for even so present at the site of the injury one needs to think that probably this patient is going to suffer from thoracic trauma now what happens when the patient uh, suffers an accident there are two main type of forces which comes into play one is the acceleration deceleration force and this acceleration deceleration force results uh, results in you know what happens is that the Uh, the body in force the body the internal organs of the body are already in motion and as uh, and the and the and the external part of the body stops so because of the motion of the internal organs of the body there is a tear wear and tear which results in um, injury into the internal organs another type of injury which occurs is the compression injury and this occurs because the body gets compressed between a subject and a hard surface so this can result in just direct injury to the chest wall and internal organs so when we talk about the anatomy of the chest wall chest is a confluence of three major organ systems of the body the airway the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system so whenever there is a blunt trauma we can we need to look for you know injury to all these systems because it is important that disruption of any of these systems can lead to the loss of the life of the patient so another thing which we need to look for is that is there any injury to the danger box the danger box has been defined as the region between the nipple lines the the inferior neck line and the diaphragm so in case there is any injury to this region one needs to think that probably there is heart lying underneath there is pleural lying underneath so it is possible that the patient is having a myocardial injury so management of trauma patient begins in the pre hospital region though this part is deficit deficient in our country but um, it is a well it is a specialty in itself in the western countries so management begins in the pre hospital region initial assessment and treatment of patients with thoracic trauma consists of primary survey with resuscitation of vital functions and then there is a detailed secondary survey which is followed by the definitive care so when it come, comes to the pre hospital management pre hospital management of trauma victims needs to be provided in guidelines with the atls principles so uh, it is very important that airway breathing and circulation of the patient is uh, is maintained and patient is transport to the closest trauma center one needs to take care that there is cervical spine immobilization at the time of trauma the 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 lab the the rescue workers should be able to provide high flow oxygen and do adequate monitoring the patient however it is very important that the time is very crucial and no time should be wasted in securing an iv line um in securing an iv line and uh, then in case um, endotracheal intubation should definitely be avoided till and until the lab, uh, the, um, the, uh, the 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 healthcare workers thinks that it is essential to intubate the patient it should be pre hospital intubation should be avoided another thing which healthcare workers can do is that they can have an idea they can give the um, uh, the treating physician they can you know record what what all uh, has happened to the vehicle at the time of an accident because extent of damage to the vehicle gives an idea of the extent of 
damage or the extent of trauma the patient might have suffered. For example, if there is a significant intrusion into the passenger compartment, there is deformed steering wheel, there is ejection of the patient from the vehicle that indicates that probably the patient uh, will have blunt thoracic trauma. So on arrival to the hospital, clinicians should first assess the and stabilize the patient's airway, breathing and circulation in the order of ABC. We all know that the ABC is very important for resuscitation of trauma patients. We follow ABCDE. But here, when it comes to blunt thoracic chest, though we say ABC, one thing which can happen is that at times B can take priority over A. Why do I say so? Because a blunt trauma chest can be associated with tension pneumothorax. And so if the patient has a tension pneumothorax, then, you know, decompressing that pneumothorax probably takes priority over uh, over um, securing or over, you know, assessing the airway in these patients. So airway potency should be ensured. Breathing, one should look for a chest wall, look for the movement, auscultate, look for palpate for any crepitus, auscultate for any uh, inadequate air, air entry. And in case there is a desaturation or patient is very tickipening, they should, um, they should be able to think that the patient has tension pneumothorax and treatment should be provided. So major problems should be corrected and identified as the person goes along in the primary survey. So it is very crucial. Again, I'm emphasizing that life-threatening emergencies should be treated as they are identified. We should not keep on thinking that I would first complete the ABCDE for the primary survey and then go and do the treat the life-threatening emergencies. So life-threatening emergencies need to be treated and EFAST mm -hmm. is typically performed as a part of primary survey in hemodynamically unstable patients. So if the patient is unstable, probably because of tension pneumothorax, ultrasound can be brought in as Professor Kajal Jain already told and it should be performed to make a fast diagnosis and um, decompress the chest of the patient. So uh, the rule of the thumb is that the treat life-threatening emergencies as they are identified. Now, during the primary evaluation of end management, 12 major injuries that can be remembered as deadly dozen are associated with blunt trauma, uh, trauma thoracic injury. So six of these are imminent uh, life threats, that they're the lethal six, that should be evaluated and treated in the primary assessment. And other six are the potential life threats that should be evaluated and treated in the secondary assessment. So uh, my talk is going to be restricted to these lethal six injuries and then to the potential hidden six injuries. So these are the lethal six injuries. They are airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax. Open pneumothorax is mostly associated with the um, uh, in uh, penetrating lung injury, so I will not be talking about it much. Then there would be massive pneumothorax, flail chest injury, and cardiac tamponade. These can be remembered by the synonym ATOM FC. So airway obstruction, airway obstruction can occur secondary to laryngeal injury or tracheobronchial tree injury. So these are the two main 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 types of injuries which you can anticipate, which you can think about when your patient has blunt thoracic trauma. So laryngeal trauma, laryngeal injury occurs because of the direct blow to the neck or because of shoulder restraint that is misplaced with the shoulder restraint that is misplaced like seat belt that is misplaced across the neck. So posterior dislocation of clavicular head occasionally leads to airway obstruction. So another type of injury which can occur is proctobronchial tree injury and this usually occurs at the confluence of the bifurcation of the trachea into major right and left Bronchi bronchioles. This occurs because uh, the carina is the fixed part of the trachea, and the injuries occur when they the, when they when at the at the junction of the fixed and the moving part because of the uh, rapid acceleration acceleration force which occurs at the time of the trauma. So uh, identification of upper airway trauma, like the laryngeal trauma, is not very 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 difficult. So it is easy and can be done, but problem occurs when there is an uh, there is an injury of the lower airway as the identification as, as, as it is at times difficult to diagnose it initially. So in case uh, the patients can have external neck deformity or hematoma, they can have hoarseness of voice. And the most important thing is whenever we are anticipating an airway, dif airway, dif airway trauma, the patients can have varying degree of dyspnea and subcutaneous emphysema. Another important thing which can be present is uh, pneumothorax. So, Emphysema can be present in 20 to 50 percent of the patients, while pneumothorax can be present in 50 to 60 percent of the patients. So, uh, 
interventions will be directed initially towards the treatment of the pneumothorax because this is probably what the what the um, what the prim primary care you know the person who is providing the primary primary survey for the patient would come across so uh, uh, as we go ahead further in the secondary survey we realize that tracheobronchial injuries are mostly diagnosed at that time because the pneumothorax continues to persist even after performing a decompression like putting in a chest tube and this is because the air is keeping is leaking continuously leaking from that trauma in the airway into the subcutaneous tissue and into the chest wall so another important thing which can be seen is a fallen lung sign where you see that the lung uh, is a small is a collapsed structure present at the base of the um, cavity while the rest of the cavity is filled with the air so what is the management so a uh, high flow oxygen it is i think it is a rule that whenever a trauma victim comes one thing we should do is that uh, connect the patient to the oxygen airway maneuvers should be used to achieve the airway patency however one needs to remember that it might not always be possible to achieve ventilation after airway patency because uh, uh, there can be a disconnection between the airway upper and the lower airway supposing the patient has a tracheobronchial injury even if you ensure a airway patency by doing a jaw jaw thrust it is possible that the oxygen is not reaching the lungs of the patient because of the injury so uh, so air, surgical airway may be required further one needs to as dr um, sheila talked about in the previous lecture thoracic uh, blunt th blunt thoracic injury th thoracic injury is one area where you need to be very careful when you are doing a rapid sequence induction it is possible that you induce the patient and after that you realize that um, you are not being able to ventilate the patient or secure the airway because of disruption of tracheobronchial tree so this might be lethal Uh, so this is one case where uh, where one needs to be very vigilant before one uh, administers muscle relaxant to the patient so surgical airway may be required as endotracheal intubation with left left uh, with direct laryngoscopy might not be possible because of a distorted airway now another very interesting thing which might happen is that there is a tracheobronchial injury and one can see the uh, see the see the proximal end of the trachea coming out of the out of the wound it most commonly happens in penetrating wounds but can happen at times in blunt trauma also so if the distal if the proximal and distal end of the trachea is proximal and like if the end of the trachea can be seen the distal end can be secured with the help of forceps and then the patient can be intubated through the wound and one can consider using a buji to ensure that it goes into the endo, into the trachea so once the airway is secured uh, one needs to do a bronchoscopy and then probably a thoracotomy at a later stage to ensure that um, the adequate repair is done uh, so after airway obstruction second thing which we will talk about is tension pneumothorax uh, so pneumothorax uh, what is pneumothorax pneumothorax is uh, air inside the pleural cavity and tension pneumothorax is that when this air cannot exit and it continues to build up pressure within the within the pleural cavity so this is fatal if not immediately identified treated and then again if you have provided the treatment one needs to reassess that the treatment which has been provided is adequate why do i say so now why does tension pneumothorax happen tension pneumothorax happens when a fractured rib is driven into the pleura and causes laceration of the pleura and the second thing is when the epiglottis is closed during sudden pressure increase and there is a sudden increase in pressure in the tracheobronchial tree this most commonly happens at the time of acceleration deceleration injuries uh, traumatic injuries so early signs are there is anxiety patient has respiratory distress the examiner can see that there is unilateral chest movement on on and on auscultation the breath signs sounds might be diminished or absent on one side so as the problem continues uh, what happens is that the intrathoracic pressure keeps on building up the venous return uh, to the heart gets impaired because of increased pressure so there is jugular venous distension uh, and as there is no venous return no no venous return to the heart cardiac output decreases resulting in signs of decompensating shock and narrow pulse pressure so by uh, you know ultrasound can be brought in at this time to even before this time once one is anticipating that there is tension pneumothorax ultrasound could be brought in and as uh, it has already been shown in the previous talk um, a normal lung sliding sign can be seen in this and these are comet lines which can be seen 
However, when there is a pneumothorax, um, uh, one doesn't see uh, the pleura moving, and uh, then there is no comet line and no comet tail present behind below the pleura. Now, if we put a M mode on this, the normal the normal um, M mode would be a seizure sign. While if the patient has a pneumothorax, the diagnostic is a barcode sign. So once this is there on um, on uh, eFast, eFast. Uh, one need one can be sure that there is a pneumothorax and then if it is a tension pneumothorax uh, immediate decompression needs to be done so now again one should put in oxygen give oxygen to the patient at a flow of 15 liter per minute using a non rebreathing mask now needle decompression is a early and fast way of doing decompression as it allows air to escape from the pleural space and equilibrates the pressure in the pleural cavity to the atmosphere However, one needs to remember that this is not a definitive treatment, and as it cannot, uh, you know, restore negative pool pressure. As a result, patient, uh, you know, uh, might not be able to ade generate adequate tidal volume and restore ventilation. So, how do we do needle compression? Needle decompression can be done in the second and third intercostal space in the mid clavicular line, using a 14 gauge needle over a catheter. So, once the needle, uh, once one gets a whoosh because of it needs to be connected to a syringe. Once um, the physician enters the um, pleural space, there is a whoosh, uh, and after that, the catheter can be threaded out and the needle taken out. Now, uh, this needle uh, placement can fail, and this is where a physician has to be very particular. It is possible that the needle stays inside the chest wall outside the pleural cavity, and the person might think, the treating physician might think that there is no pneumothorax or it can go into the subcutaneous emphysema. So there would be a small aspirate of the air and after that no air would come. Or the needle can go into the vascular structures. So uh, now what will happen? If all these things happen, there would not be any decompression and the patient would still continue to have those signs. Also, once these catheters are placed, it is possible that these catheters might get kinked. So, you know, you are put in a, put in a catheter and you think that I can proceed with my primary survey ahead of this. It is possible that the catheter being thin might get kinked at any time and the patient can again develop pneumothorax without the treating physician. Uh, you know, knowing about it. So this can be lethal. So it is always essential that once a tube uh, needle decompression has been done, a thoracostomy uh, pleural space is decompressed by putting in a chest tube. Even if the chest tube is not placed, uh, one can immediately do a open, give a nick in the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line and then do a uh, finger, finger um, th thoracotomy. Uh, thoracotomy, this will result in decompression of the pleura and chest tube can be placed at that time or in case the treating physician needs to go ahead with the rest of the steps of the primary survey, chest tube can always be placed later. So this is how we manage tension pneumothorax. Uh, coming to massive hemothorax, now uh, massive hemothorax is defined as accumulation of more than 1500 cc of blood or one third of the blood volume in chest cavity over a very short period of time. So hemothorax is usually caused by injury to the intercostal vessels or inter interparenchymal pulmonary vessels due to rib fracture. One needs to suspect hemothorax when there are more than two or three rib fractures. The incidence is 6.7% if there is no rib fracture and 24% if there are one to two rib fractures. Now. In hemothorax, there are two things a physician is dealing with. One is hemodynamic instability due to hypovolemia because uh, the patient is losing blood in the pleural cavity. So that is causing hemodynamic instability. Second is the pressure exerted by this blood which is getting collected is, you know, is making the lung collapse. So there is lung atelectasis and both these things cause respiratory distress. So, um, uh, the symptoms which are commonly present, the signs and symptoms which you see in these patients is that there is respiratory distress, there is tachypnea, patient can have hypoxia, hypotension. And uh, most important is that there is chest wall asymmetry because one side of the chest is moving and other side is possibly is not moving. So, treatment, coming to treatment, 
one needs to again give high flow oxygen to maintain target saturation now important thing about hemothorax is that we need to ensure that iv fluid volume fluid resuscitation is continued as same time as chest compression decompression because um, uh, the, uh, because in case we do one and do not do another it is possible that we might lose the patient and um, you know adequate resuscitation is not adequate so uh, so immediate intercostal chest tube insertion needs to be placed so to re-expand the lamp, lung. Another thing is that once the chest tube is placed, that this re-expanding lung itself acts as a tamponade. And, uh, you know, the blood vessels which are bleeding are compressed by the expanding lung. So it acts as a treatment itself. So chest tube decompression is very important. And then one needs to activate massive transfusion protocol also probably because it is possible that this would be associated with other injuries and patient might be in hemodynamic in in high, in volume shock uh, at the time at the time one is trying to decompress the chest so a volume replacement and massive transfusion protocols should be initiated in these patients So uh, when, once you have put in a chest tube, how is it decided that these patients are in are candidates for surgical thoracotomy? So if blood drainage is more than 20 ml per kg, um, per kg and shock is persistent along with substantial bleeding that is more than 3 ml per kg per hour for 3 hours, that means that the patient is a candidate for surgical thoracotomy and should be wheeled in for the surgery. Next lethal injury, which is seen in the primary survey, is the flail chest. Now, flail chest is defined as fracture of two or more ribs in two or more locations. Now, this results in the segment of chest wall that is no longer in continuity with the rest of the thoracic cage. So, paradoxical chest movement uh, movements can result, and this segment moves inwards on inspiration as the rest of the chest expands and moves out on inspiration. This means that the underlying lung does not expand, and as a result, the tidal volume decreases. As a result, the respiratory rate increases, the saturation decreases, and the patient goes into the respiratory distress. So, patient will complain of chest pain, respiratory distress. One can feel a bony crepitus, and there can be paradox. Then, and paradoxical chest wave movements are visible on inspection of the chest wall. So, management again includes providing high flow oxygen. Now, analgesia is very important in these patients and can be administered with one gram of paracetamol, which can be again, you know, after that um, uh, uh, charted every eighth hourly. In addition, anesthetics can be given if they are not contraindicated and um, if the pain is severe and is, hemp is producing a chest wall guarding and patient is not able to breathe, patients can always be administered small boluses of opioids like fentanyl. So, early block of use of regional anesthesia, such as intercostal nerve blocks, paravertebral block, epidural anesthesia, is are advocated because if we use more opioids, uh, it is possible that uh, our patient might go into respiratory depression. So, it is always better to resort to early early nerve blocks in these patients. So, close monitoring of saturation, respiratory effort, and ABG is very important in these patients. And the as, as if we do not do that, it is possible that these patients might need intubation and mechanical ventilation at a later stage. So coming to the next very important uh, component of uh, primary survey is uh, lethal injury in primary survey is the cardiac tamponade. So uh, what is cardiac tamponade? Cardiac tamponade is actually the accumulation of the blood in the pericardial space in the settings of for trauma. So uh, what happens when the blood gets collected? So when the blood is collected, there is reduced ventricular filling and the cardiac output decreases. This results in hemodynamic compromise and then this patient can go into cardiogenic shock. Now high mechanical blunt trauma, uh, particularly in the region of cardiac box, like the danger box or the cardiac box, which I talked about earlier, uh, should raise the suspicion that this patient can have a cardiac tamponade. And only 60 ml of the blood is enough um, enough uh, to for the development of cardiac tamponade in a patient. Now, uh, the another very dicey thing which can happen is that these patients might sound stable initially because the blood which is which is collecting in the pericardial cavity might leak, you know, might decompress by emptying in, into the pleura. So uh, it is possible that the blood collection occurs slowly and the patient as the time progresses, we'll start complaining of chest pain, tachypnea, and dyspnea. 
So Beck triad, which consists of hypotension, neck vein distension, and muffled heart sounds, uh, is something which goes in the favor of um, uh, pericardial uh, tamponade. However, when it comes to trauma patient, one needs to be sure that it is possible that this typical triad is not present, as uh, hypovolemia and shock would cause collapse of the of the vein so there is no blood to get collected in the in the venous system so there is no distension of veins at times in these patients so the treating physician should know this so chest x ray would show an enlarged cardiac like the ct ratio would be altered and the cardiac image uh, cardiac shadow would be would be lar larger in size so once uh, the diagnosis the diagnosis is again made on the basis of efast as has already been discussed in the previous talk and this is how it looks like that this is the um, this is the subcostal view this is the right atrium left right this is the left ventricle this is the right ventricle and then one can see the collection of fluid here so this uh, that right ventricle is a very uh, slit like structure because it is getting compressed because of the fluid so this is one uh, this is what one comes across when an e fast is done and the treatment is pericardiocentesis pericardiocentesis means that you need to aspirate the fluid out of the pericardial cavity. Uh, so uh, again, one needs to ensure that IV fluids are um, adequately started and resuscitated when one starts during the procedure. Pericardiocentesis can be done blindly, it can be done ECG guided or it can be done ultrasound guided. So there are different approaches. Sub Postal approach is the most commonly used when one, uh, you know, uh, uses a um, uh, 18 gauge uh, needle with a catheter and it is introduced at an, at an angle of 45 degree directed towards the left shoulder, um, mostly ultrasound guided with the assistance of ultrasound uh, into the pericardial cavity. And uh, then one can see the um, needle entering the um, pericardial uh, peri pericardial space. Just below this. So one very important thing which one needs to differentiate is the difference between the cardiac tamponade and um, tension pneumothorax. These are these both can be worsened by positive pressure ventilation. These both can be relieved by a single needle. And these are the two conditions which can lead to the death of the patient if not intervened at the time, at the right time. So uh, what happens when the primary care physician, when the physician is trying to resuscitate the patient and, um, you know, um, uh, probably he or she realizes that the patient is going to enter into a cardiac arrest, probably because of some hemodynamic instability, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, they cannot make out or which they cannot control. So emergency department thoracotomy is another procedure which can be done in emergency when the, when the, when the, uh, when the, when the resuscitating person can open up the thoracic cavity of the patient and uh, to, to ensure that uh, he or she is able to decompress pericardium if there is a cardiac tamponade or give CPR if the heart is arrested or, you know, clamp the iota in case they think that there is aortic dissection of the patient. However, uh, the rationale for performing an emergency department thoracotomy uh, has to be very clear because uh, emergency department thoracotomy entails risk. Transmission of communicable diseases can happen, there, such as HIV and hepatitis can occur. There are multiple sharp instruments, suture needles, open rib fractures that can cause hydrogenic injury. So one needs to be very clear that what are the indications for emergency department, department thoracotomy. So uh, it is indicated in blunt trauma chest only if it is a witnessed cardiac arrest, which is with the CPR time being of less than five minutes. So uh, it should be done if 
the treating physician thinks that there is a massive cardiac tamponade or there is a massive hemorrhage which is occurring in the intrathoracic cavity probably because of aortic dissection or there is an air embolism when they can do the direct cardiac massage by doing an emergency department thoracotomy it is contraindicated in patients with the, it has been found that the outcome is better in patients with penetrating blunt trauma rather than with blunt trauma. So in blunt trauma, it is indicated only if the time of CPR has been less than five minutes. And in penetrating trauma, it can be done if the CPR time has been more than 15 minutes and there are no, no signs of life. So again, this is one systematic meta-analysis and review where they found that the survivors uh, survivor rate was only 0.54% when emergency department thoracotomy was done in blunt trauma victims, vice versa. It was 5.8% when it was done in patients with penetrating trauma injury. So uh, coming to the secondary survey, the secondary survey of the patient with thoracic trauma involves further in-depth history and physical examination, ongoing ECG and pulse oximeter monitoring, arterial blood gas analysis, upright chest x-ray in patients with and without suspect uh, spinal cord injury, and a CT scan in selected patients whom a treating physician thinks might be having aortic or spinal cord injury. Now, unlike the Unlike the, unlike the immediately life-threatening conditions that are recognized during the primary survey, there are still six lethal conditions that can be recognized at the time of this secondary survey. And these are the six conditions. First is blunt cardiac injury. So 50% of the blunt cardiac injuries can have been found in relation to motor vehicle accidents. And patients with these injuries usually report, you know, one can see a, a, a mark of the steering wheel on the front of the chest. Diagnosis is difficult because there is no gold standard, uh, gold standard, you know, test available to make a diagnosis of blunt trauma chest. However, patients can have myocardial concussion, contusion, or at times, you know, myocardial rupture. However, the patients who have a myocardial rupture probably do not reach ED. So, uh, clinically significant, uh, you know, patients can have chest discomfort. And uh, the thing is that the most of the times these discomforts are, uh, are, you know, attributed by the treating physician to fractures or rib, or rib fractures or contusions or fracture of the sternum. So they can be missed at times. So clinically significant sequelae are hypotension, dysarrhythmias, regional wall motion abnormalities on ECG. And the patient can be having VPCs, unexplained sinus tachycardia. Patient in the secondary, you know, after after the, after the primary survey has completed, might start developing um, AV blocks. There can be increased CVP. So all these should lead the treating physician to think that there might be some underlying cardiac contusion. So one should get an ECG done for these patients. Uh, cardiac markers do not have much role to play. And um, however, most of the times, the risk of dysrhythmias decrease and the contusion starts settling by themselves. And if the patient is stable for 24 hours, usually these two patients do not require any further management. Coming to tracheobronchial injury, as I already said, that if it if it is it, it needs to be diagnosed in primary survey if there is a tension pneumothorax, but it is possible that most of the times it is missed at that time. It is not that severe, but as the air keeps on progressing. Um, uh, the, the severity of tracheobronchial injury keeps on increasing. So uh, the diagnostic feature is again a persistent pneumothorax. Uh, like in case the pneumothorax fails to resolve, then the treating physician needs to think about the, the uh, air, this uh, tracheobronchial injury. Diagnosis, definitive diagnosis can be made by bronchoscopy and patient can be taken up for surgery depending upon uh, you know uh, how severe the injury is. Coming to thoracic aortic disruptions, uh, now 80% of the patients uh, with, the, with the blunt thoracic trauma develop thoracic aortic disruptions and this is the cause of death in 80% of the patients who do not reach hospital. So in minority of the patients, adventitia and mediastinal structures contain the rupture. These patients generally sustain, um, you know, these Patients might be asymptomatic initially, but they can sustain aortic rupture within 24 hours. So we have a window period of 24 hours when we need to diagnose this condition and then probably save the life of the patient. So these are the X-ray findings which can make a treating physician think about um, you know uh, the aortic dis uh, aortic disruption. These include wide mediastinum, 
a wide mediastinum obscured aortic knob, then there can be large left hemothorax, there can be deviation of the nasogastric tube, or there can be deviation of the trachea to the opposite side. So, uh, usually CT scan of the chest has to be performed in high-risk patients if the treating physician has the, you know, has the suspicion based upon x-ray findings. Um, however, the problem is that if these patients are unstable, then it might not be possible to do a CT scan and emergency thoracotomy might have to be done for these patients. So, the approach to treat these patients depend upon whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or hemodynamically unstable. So a, a patient who has a chest wall contusion, who has multiple rib fractures, who has a seat belt sign across the abdomen are the patients who should be put in category of high risk patients who can be having aortic dis uh, this uh, aortic dissection. So uh, uh, the, once the CT has been done for these patients, the treatment depends upon the grade of injury of the CT scan. There are four types of injury. So if it is type one injury, like it is just an intimal Tear, one needs to control the blood pressure so that there is, the tear does not increase in size and um, and uh, and the lesion heals by itself. However, surgical treatment is indicated when, uh, when the type grade of tear is from type 2 to type 4. Now, uh, there are two types of surgical treatments. It can be an open thoracotomy where the incision is done, where, which is done by the surgical team or an endovascular repair can be done. So this is the algorithm which is usually followed if there is a chest radiograph which shows abnormal mediastinal widening. If the patient is stable, one needs to do a CT scan. And if the patient is unstable, then you take up this patient in the OR and uh, to evaluate the aorta after surgical thoracotomy. Another important problem which can develop in the first 24 hours is the pulmonary contusion. So it generally develops within the first 24 hours and resolves in about a week's time. Pain control and pulmonary toilet are the mainstay of therapy for these patients. So one can see irregular non-lobular opacifications of the lung parenchyma in the X-ray and these keeps on increasing as the, as the, as the number of days to injury increase. So about one third of the time, the contusion is not evident on initial radiographs and one needs to resort to CT. However, contusions evident on CT scan uh, uh, means if they're not seen on X-ray and they're seen on CT scan means they're not very severe and then they have a, probably a better outcome than the contusions which are seen on X-ray. So complications include pneumonia and ARDS. Another complication which is less and is seen in 1% of patients is diaphragmatic rupture. One can see that a patient with trauma comes to emergency department probably after a week or so with the history of, uh, you know, the things, the abdominal contents, her, the history of shortness of breath and an x-ray shows the abdominal contents herniating into the diaphragm. This is common more on the left side probably because the liver supports the diaphragm on the left side. So injuries are more common on the left side. So again, this is a surgical intervention. One needs to, you know, replace the content back into the abdomen and do the surgery. Occult pneumothorax is another life-threatening thing which comes in the secondary survey and um, one needs to be very careful about it because it might not be visible on x-ray but the problem can happen once the patient is intubated and goes on ventilator. So this pneumothorax will then expand and produce tension pneumothorax. So the treatment is that in case you do a CT and you do a occult, you see occult pneumothorax, if the size is less than 8 mm, then one can, um, you know, keep the patient on continuous observation. However, uh, at any time, if the size increases or the patient shows clinical deterioration, tube thoracostomies should be done in these patients. Another trauma which can happen is esophageal rupture. Now, this can happen because of the, because of the traction from the cervical Compression. I am sorry. I can't. Traction from the cervical, um, from the cervical, uh, no, when one uh, cervical hyperextension and direct penetration from the thoracic fractures. So uh, the diagnostic thing is that there can be subcutaneous cervical air and there can be neck hematoma. Again, the esophageal contents might leak into the will leak into the esophagus into the mediastinum, resulting in pneumomediastinum, pleural effusion. Change in mediastinal contour, patients can develop mediastinitis. And if it is not diagnosed, usually you will see that patients in on mechanical ventilator after four to five days will start developing signs of mediastinitis. And, uh, you know, when you do a CT at that time, one realizes that there was an esophageal rupture. 
which was not taken care of and the secretions kept on uh, you know pouring into the mediastinum resulting in this mediastinitis so ct scan um, uh, sh should be used whenever there is no uh, clear diagnosis and again as i have already said the associated injuries makes the diagnosis of uh, this difficult now uh, rib fractures the middle ribs fourth to eighth rib sustain most of the impact of blunt trauma chest so direct force applied to the ribs tend to fracture them and drive the ends of the bones into the thoracic cavity resulting in um, underlying uh, hemothorax pneumothorax and contusions so uh, it has been seen that the young have a more uh, you know resilient chest ribs while the elderly have a rigid lip so whenever the elderly patients undergo trauma there is a higher probability of the ribs undergoing fracture and then the patients might develop hemothorax and pneumothorax so the clinical suspicion uh, should arise whenever there is tenderness bony crepitus ecchymosis and muscle spasm over the rib and pain on compression over the rib side uh, again chest x ray is the mainstay of treatment uh you can diagnose it on chest x ray now what happens whenever there is a rib fracture there are three main changes which occur there is pain which leads to hypoventilation and then there is an altered breathing mechanisms all these impair the gas exchange and patient can develop hypoxia further there are retention of secretions and patient can develop pneumonia so the management is uh, you need to limit the fluids because uh, as the patient becomes more positive uh, the oxygenation gets impaired further surgical fixation also has a controversial role if patient fails to you know after you know one can give cpap all the sorts of mechanical ventilations can be used and if they if the patient um, you know does not respond or at times if the number of fridge fractures are greater surgical fixation can be primarily undertaken in these patients so rule of thumb in these patients is one needs to give adequate analgesia and chest physiotherapy we have various modalities of analgesia available for these patients as i have discussed all, earlier also we can give intravenous anesthesia we can do epidural blocks intercostal nerve blocks paravertebral nerve blocks uh, or uh, now another very important fracture so um, another very important fracture which can happen is sternal fracture and this is most commonly seen when the passenger's chest strikes against the steering wheel and um, it is seen in with the use of seat belts also because the, it is probably the impact is maximum on the sternum when the person is wearing a seat belt so rapid acceleration impact from a frontal uh, red acceleration injury from a frontal impact results in sternal fracture at the site of seat belt injury so uh, these patients usually present with interior chest pain and point tenderness over the sternum once such a lateral chest x ray is seen one can see the fracture of the sternum i had a x ray of that i probably missed it so one can see the transverse most of the fracture is tra are transverse in nature and can be seen on lateral chest x rays so in these patients one needs to do screening for myocardial contusions as well as ecg because uh, the heart is lying below the sternum so it is possible that the patients might undergo uh, might have sustained undergo underlying myocardial injury management is again analgesia and patients without associated injuries uh, if they have an isolated sternal fracture they can be discharged and the fracture usually heals by itself but one needs to rule out underlying cardiac injury in these patients now one uh, last very important thing which i would like to talk about is what is the role of imaging in blunt thoracic trauma like uh, do we do ct scan for all the patients or do we wait and you know go ahead with chest x rays well we all know that chest x ray is inexpensive and non invasive on the other hand ct scan is associated with greater diagnostic accuracy so decision for ct should be based on clinical findings so this is one study which was which has been published in jama where the authors conducted uh, you know a prospective validation study which with authors studied 9905 patients to report the effectiveness of the tool which they had identified for identifying blunt trauma patients at low risk for intrathoracic injury and the authors reported that if the age of the patient is less than 60 years um, if there is no history of rapid acceleration mechanism there is no intoxication no distracting injuries no tenderness on chest wall and the mentation is normal probably those are the patients where ct scan is not needed and when one can go ahead with the chest x rays only 
on the other hand if all these conditions or even without this if there is a history of rapid acceleration mechanism chest wall tenderness sternal tenderness thoracic spine tenderness and scapular tenderness patient can first sit can so this is an extensive algorithm uh, of plus blunt chest trauma patients who are received in emergency department for the management i have discussed the whole of all of this um, and to conclude life ending thoracic injuries are very common however survival depends upon proper and immediate diagnosis and management of these patients there are large number of organs involved and one needs to know what all can be injured to you know to give timely resuscitation to these patients emergency thoracotomy might not be a very useful procedure and is expected with a survivorship of less than 10% and one should not forget the abc of trauma and damage control principles when one is resuscitating a trauma patient and at the end uh, as has already been emphasized by the previous speakers trauma working is a team work and uh, one needs to define the role of all the members in the team for effective resuscitation of the patient thank you uh thank you dr jitendra for a very comprehensive coverage of uh, this very vast topic of uh, blunt chest trauma you have nicely covered the primary secondary surveys the dead letters and the lethal checks and the hidden checks and all the uh, detailed account of uh, Uh, ten, uh, management of tension in the thorax, in the thorax, and also the finer points in managing these patients, and also the secondary survey and how we can uh, decide according to the next steps whether we need a CT scan or we can just wait. So, thank you so much for all this comprehensive uh, coverage. Uh, before going to question answer session i would like to thank the uh, rsscp team especially dr anju grewal for making uh, me a part of this very uh, uh, important uh, academic session uh, i would like to ask one question before going to the rest of the audience uh, what is the actually the difference between the nexus ct major and ct all Okay, so ma'am, your question is: What is the difference between Nexus City Major and City All? So City All, you know, took the took a major like major are the things where you need to do CT scan, irrespective of uh, whether the minor activities are present or not. So major Nexus All is when there are major along with some component of minor which are present. Uh, because according to the algorithm that uh, was shown in the end. so even if one of the criteria is positive in either ct major or in ct all yeah go so for the same management one has to go for the same yeah. so it is probably because of the you know they they the study was conducted over a number of patients so these were the these were the outcomes of the study based upon which uh, they have given this criteria yeah, but actually ct all covers everything so the major becomes sort of superfluous yeah major become city all but not all the minor if uh, uh, if all the minor criteria are there then probably one doesn't need to do a ct scan yeah so now let's go on to the question uh, questions from the other people audience uh, i don't see anything much in the chat yeah probably last talk of the day and <laughs> no <laughs> agree you have covered everything so probably it's all very clear and doesn't need any questions it is a very extensive topic and i think new for many of the anesthesiologists because probably we don't go in the tri area and try to you know yeah. uh, when uh, like when we are called blunt trauma yeah blunt trauma is i feel more important than the penetrating trauma because penetrating trauma looks very acute but uh, in blunt trauma it can be deceptive initially patient can be very stable 
and if we are not following the protocols and uh, algorithms we can miss many treatable causes and uh, we can get negative outcome yeah so it gives a false sense of security because you see less outside there is more inside in penetrating trauma you see more blood outside but there is less inside yeah definitely <laughs> and it has been seen that the outcome is better in patients with penetrating trauma than patients with blood trauma yeah definitely it's more uh, sort of rewarding yeah if you do a time and picking up the uh, lethal signs and uh, hidden signs yeah, yeah. so uh there is one uh, question what is the minimum level of hemothorax for the icd insertion pneumothorax cannot be measured hemothorax or pneumothorax hemothorax so hemothorax uh, you know when uh, it is like if you have a patient who is hemodynamically unstable as i already said there are the clinical criteria for defining the signs and symptoms of these patients you cannot measure the level of hemothorax before up before you have put in a chest tube there is no way to measure it so if your patient is becoming hemodynamically unstable and you see one side of chest is moving less than the other side and um, you know that the the percussion note is dull rather than resonant you think that it is a hemothorax and then one needs to put in a chest tube rather than waiting for what might be the volume of blood inside but it is anticipated that 1500 ml of the blood has collected in the in the pleural cavity by the time patient starts showing all these symptoms yeah and they say more than 20 ml uh, if the blood is coming at a very high rate then you would definitely go for it yeah 20 per ml per kg per hour that is madam if you have put in a chest tube your patient is pouring out blood through the chest tube at 20 ml per kg per hour for 3 hours you need to explore the patient because that okay. means that the bleeding is not getting controlled yeah another question is pericardial synthesis done in your setup for cardiac tamponade you know what pericardial synthesis is done for tamponade but i have not seen it being done in a trauma patient it has been done uh, in emergency settings but in trauma settings probably pe people are not very you know even in our hospital are not very you know they are not very much aware of this thing and it needs a very very efficient working because one needs to diagnose it all so before putting in so most of the time our residents are restricted till tension pneumothorax hemothorax hemothorax mm -hmm. and um, no, i I'm just uh, like to add something uh, dr jitendra ek what an excellent presentation i thoroughly enjoyed listening to you, uh, you. i just wanted to uh, uh, share our experience rather uh, uh, the uh, pericardial synthesis like when uh, when we analyzed all the cardiac trauma over a period of 15 years uh, we saw that the initial 3 to 4 years uh, there were quite a few patients coming to or we just analyzed the patients who came to or uh, we realized that uh, initial around 4 to 5 years there were quite a few patients uh, who uh, who underwent pericardial synthesis before uh, coming to or but gradually uh, these patients uh, they are they are now they are almost nil uh, the reason being that pericardial synthesis as you said itself takes time a secondly uh, the diagnosis the uh, making the setup and uh, doing the procedure uh, may take some time and by that time the patient may deteriorate further so uh, the now the protocol we have changed in our trauma center that the patient is directly wheeled in the or because one ot is always prepared always prepared for non responder so the disposition time from the ed to or uh, we have decreased up to 3 minutes that's the time uh, we take for a cardiac trauma patient to be on the or table and uh, so we have done with the pericardial centers so now no cardiac trauma patient would undergo pericardial centers. this is straight away comes to or um so, so that i just want to share but uh, i must say your presentation was uh, phenomenal and it covered almost everything uh, dr jitendra you were saying something 
Yeah, yeah, I want to ask you now that you wheel in your patients from ED to OT in three minutes. That means you you uh, you know uh, uh, do you mean that after the primary and secondary survey has been done or do you do that in OT? Like See, uh, secondary survey. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Secondary survey won't be done in these patients. Uh, just the primary survey. As soon as they, in fact, sometimes even the D part won't be done because this diagnosis will be done. Uh, as far as uh, you know, it will be done when the fast is done, and uh, it has been diagnosed that so the my, patient my has got. So, my next question yeah. is: How many times have you seen patients? How many times have I seen? Then, how many patients did you come across with cardiac tamponade? Around fifty-six uh, patients we have analyzed over a period of fifteen years. That's a lot of patients. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah are you there uh, dr jitendra and the time which i am saying from the ed to or is not the time uh, the patient came to ed the wheeling the time which the transportation from the, yeah trans so because uh, being uh, uh, you know geared up center and uh, both or and ed being on the same floor uh we uh, we are able to manage that yeah that's very nice there is one more question for dr jitender they have said that why is the size of uh the chest brain decrease according to i can't see the chat now uh, etls guidelines of 20 etls yeah So I think we lost her. I think we have lost connection with her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's dinner time for everybody. So <laughs> I believe we lost. Uh, may can I answer this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so the latest edition, the tenth edition, ETLS has decreased the size of uh, chest train. The reason being that it was seen that uh, a smaller size tube also suffices. It serves a purpose. Uh, it can drain the hemothorax. and the chances of complication lesser than a bigger size tube uh, so that's why it has been reduced in the latest edition thank you so much thank you so much so uh, over to you dr indu grewal ma'am thank you ma'am uh, <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much for chairing the session thank you tripit and thank you ma'am and thank you dr babita thank you dr jitender uh, it's been an excellent time and i'll hand over the mic to dr tanveer singh for the vote of thanks thank you ma'am <clears throat> it's a matter of pride for me that uh, i am proposing a vote of thanks for this academic fiesta let me first of all start by giving glory to almighty god for making today's webinar a resounding success I on behalf of RSCP Ludhiana branch extend my sincere thanks to the patrons of RSCP Dr H L Kolsar and Dr Tej K Kolsar the stalwarts who are the backbone of the society no event can be successful without people who dedicate their time and resources to make sure that everything is flawless heartfelt gratitude to our president Dr Indrani ma'am president elect dr navin malhotra sir vice president dr anju grewal ma'am secretary dr vishal singla sir treasurer dr sethi sir editor in chief dr pradeep bhatia sir we have been fortunate enough to have renowned academic personalities as chairpersons in today's webinar thanks to dr sk singla sir dr babita ma'am dr tina bansal ma'am dr rakhi goel ma'am dr vivek gupta sir dr jp atri sir and dr uh, meenu pandit rao ma'am and dr tripath kaur ma'am for chairing today's sessions and sharing with us their graceful opinion i express hearty gratitude to speakers dr kajal jain ma'am dr harsimran singh sir dr sheela matra ma'am and dr jitender makkar ma'am for sharing their knowledge and experiences I would like to place my hearty thanks to all the delegates for attending today's webinar and making it a success. Thanks to Dr. Ashok Sham and Mr. Rahul Chaube for technical support and live streaming, right? Uh, uh, live streaming this webinar on Anesthesia TV and enabling us in reaching a wider audience. 
words are not enough to thank everyone for such an appreciable involvement and the willingness they have expressed to make this event a success thank you everyone see you all in the next rscp webinar long live rscp so with this we can end the session vishal sir we'll hand over the mic to dr navin malhotra and dr vishal singla and uh, request them to close the session it was pleasure listening to all the uh, faculty members and good interaction and uh, pleasure to have all of them with us and uh, see you all on 15th of april and i think we will have to take care of the time limits in future again <laughs> yes true definitely sir vishal uh, it was wonderful session and uh, i would like to congratulate uh, team ludhiana ma'am anju uh, uh, dr anju garewal ma'am dr tanvir uh, dr vivek dr katyal sir everybody and uh, it was wonderful session from the speakers and the chairpersons and uh, we'll be meeting next on 15th of april uh, and uh, team chandigarh would be leading under the leadership of uh, dr palta sir so madam indrani with your permission can we have uh, can we close the session please ma'am Thank you very much, Vishal. It was a very memorable webinar, and the topics were dealt with the complex and the dealt all the complexities of trauma management. And the speakers made it so simple to understand. And uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Katyal, Dr. Anju Grewal, Dr. Tanvir Singh, and all the people who who could organize this webinar so well. and to all the speakers who did full justice to this topic and to all the chair persons eminent chair persons who have come who have been part of this webinar and uh, a very successful webinar congratulations once again and long live rscp long live rscp and great all thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you all stay safe and good night good night good night